we are recording. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for coming in and joining us at our first virtual community conference. We figured we'd kind of set the tone and start off these sessions. Um, uh, you know, at the Chris, do we have a poll ready to go? We do. This year at the uh, Bloomington event, I did um, an update at our closing ceremonies about our organization, First Indiana Robotics, the new rebranding, um, and essentially our mission, uh, vision, purpose, et cetera. So uh, Chris, if you could push out that poll, that'd be fantastic. I just kind of want to see who's already heard this you know, speech, um, who would be interested in hearing it again, things like that. Okay. So it we, should be out there. I, I pushed it out there. If people aren't seeing it, then we're having a technical issue. But. Cool. So if anyone can see polls. No. That, no. Okay. I see the okay. I see the main chart, the main slide. Okay. Well. I think I just lost. Yep. Hey, I see polls. Hey, Chris is, is it voting. working? People are voting. People are voting. Okay. And then I will also watch for the participant list and, and as people calling, we've had a few new people join us. Fantastic. So, um, We've had uh, 407 vote, probably as good as it's gonna get. So let's take a look at those results, shall we? Sounds good. You should see the uh, results there. Uh, if you don't see the results, 80% said no, oh. uh, and 20% said yes. Uh, so uh, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so that's exciting. Um, all right, so in that case, so the name of this session is, um, it's not what you do, it's why you do it. And so uh, those who know me know that I love Simon Sinek um, so much. And so hopefully either if you don't know who he is, you will learn so soon um, who he is. But the big thing that he talks about is this idea of the golden circle. And so uh, he talks about starting with why. Most times companies and organizations, they start with what you do. Uh, and so what you do is typically, you know, you build robots, you make computers, you know, things like that. But if you start with why you do something, uh, it's a much more powerful conversation. And so, you know, he, he gives this beautiful example in his TED talk that I highly recommend that you watch uh, where he talks about Apple um, and how, you know, their why is focused on changing the status, status quo and the way that they want to do that. So their how is that they focus on building um, easy to use, you know, simple designs. And then, you know, their what is you want to buy this computer. And so, you know, that whole concept is something that when we brought Chris on, um, you know, he, he and I are, were big fans of Simon Sinek together. Uh, and then we kind of essentially worked through that process, talked with our board, um, and started developing our own why, how, and what for the first Indiana Robotics organization. So working with first headquarters and their new marketing initiatives, uh, we identified that our why we do what we do is essentially and what we believe in is that we believe our future is built better together. So that's a tagline you'll see a lot. But then we also believe that improving the world starts with our youth. And that's a really important piece because that is our students. Uh, and so if there are any students on the call, you know that, that means you. Like we believe that you will be the ones who will change our future and will make it better. And that by working together is how we will accomplish true change. And so diving down into how we're going to do that, we identified some of our main, um, you know, guiding essentially strategic pillars of the organization. And so we do that through mentorship, partnered with hands-on learning, problem solving, connected to community engagement, and core values applied in, in times of intense competition. And these are important pieces because, you know, this Every single robotics program out there has hands-on learning. Every program has problem solving and they all typically have intense competition or some type of competition. But the reason FIRST is unique 
is because of this mentoring as aspect. And so this idea that you, know, you have mentors and community professionals who are working with you, uh, the fact that you are actually working with your community to solve problems. And so in the Lego Lead program with the projects that these students create, uh, the entrepreneurial aspects of that and the kids actually, you know, solving true community problems and coming up with these simplistic but creative and important solutions, it's just, you know, mind boggling to think that fifth graders could make a difference, um, could make such a big difference in how people learn uh, by creating a, a, a calculator app that is color coded so that people with um, dyslexia related to numbers don't flip the numbers around. I just love those examples. But then also there's this idea of core values. And so that's where you see the students in our program and the teams in our program really focusing on uh, making sure that everyone's competing at the highest level possible. And so this idea of gracious professionalism, giving away their timeouts, helping teams if something goes wrong with their robot, that core value um, and the core values that FIRST has, those five different aspects of it, are just a critical component of this program. And that's really what makes us unique and special. And then ultimately, what we do, it's, it's about more than the robot. And I'm sure people are sick of you know, hearing those different pieces, but it's true. Um, we're a robotics community that prepares young people for life. And again, that's a piece that was taken from headquarters. Um, truly, I, I've been endlessly impressed with their latest marketing, you know, groups, but, um, you know, tr it, it's really about the students and about the kids and where we can take you to. Uh, so, you know, we, we've developed these different pieces and we really focus again on that idea of mentorship plus hands-on learning, uh, on the problem solving inside of the community with community engagement. And then again, these core values that are found in times of intense competition, um, and so when you put it all together, it kind of looks a lot like this. And when our students, you know, when it, when it came time to become the program delivery partner for First Lego League Junior and for the First Tech Challenge program and for First Robotics Competition program, you know, we realized we needed to really bring everyone together. And so that's why we focus on rebranding. And so at this point, uh, what I'd like to essentially ask the group to submit questions for, and I think Chris and I are going to make sure, um, you know, that we can see questions, is I really love this question um, when I ask students it, which is what problem do you want to solve in the world? And when I, the first time I asked the student this, we sat there and just kind of went back and forth for 20 minutes about all of these various things that they were interested in um, at the World Championship in Detroit. And it, it had a big impact on them. And as I continued to ask my student board of directors members, um, it really started helping students kind of define not just what they want to do in the world, but what problems they want to solve. You know, what's their essentially their personal why, um, which again is another book that Simon Sinek wrote, which is called Find Your Why. And it's amazing. Um, and Chris Osborne and I have definitely read it before. But I also know that that question can be really scary. Like, what if you don't want to solve problems in the world? Uh, what if you just really enjoy the way things were, you know, a few weeks ago? You know, eh, coronavirus. Anyway, um, so if it's a scary question to ask, what problem do you want to solve in the world? Can you? I would just love it if you could put in the chat what brings you joy. Or if you're not, if that's not really sparking any, you know, brainstorming or ideas of like things that you'd want to work on, what about what makes you angry and how would you want to solve it? For example, uh, it really frustrates me that drill handles don't fit my hand. So this is a, you know, taken apart tool. Like I can't actually like close my hand there. And so this is like big and bulky and hard to use. And uh, this is a 3D printed image of my hand. And what makes me frustrated is that there are not many tools and drills that are available for people with smaller hands. So that is a problem that I am working on kind of solving and figuring out. So those are a few questions that I really want to us to uh, go through and ask. And at this time, um, yep, going to. The chat is open and it should be functional. Yeah. Sounds perfect. Uh, and then we also, Chris, can you only see half my screen again?
Renee, I can see your PowerPoint window. Good. Fantastic. Um, so today, you know, we kind of started with it's not what you do, it's why you do it. Um, but I wanted to highlight some of these different pieces. And so to start off uh, is really focusing on how can we build a virtual community. So these are, this is essentially a time for us to go into our round table, have a discussion about um, how can we build a virtual community? What do you want to see in it? Uh, and I also want to talk about the importance of gratitude as a way to make sure that um, we're in a good mental space. And so we're gonna start there in terms of round tables. We're going to go into space and other fun Q and A with Danny Blau, um, starting at around 5.30. There'll be a little bit of time for a break. Uh, we'll keep the chat open and running and I'll still be here, um, but it gives people a chance to run and grab something to eat um, and go from there. And then Danny will come in, um, you know, between those periods, and then he'll also go into one about design and Andy Mark parts, etc. I think that he probably could have come up with a better uh, name, but again, we were working pretty quickly on pulling these together. And then to wrap this up, uh, we have Andy Baker coming in just to talk um, and kind of send us off. And then we'll be here next Thursday and Friday, depending on the level of interest. Uh, we would love to have other people kind of going through these different um, pieces. And so, as an example. These are kind of the different topics that you have. Roundtables could either be, you know, an hour, um, 45 minutes. That's kind of where we're targeting those. Uh, they're discussions that are open-ended and they're there for facilitation discussion. A fin talk is essentially something that should be highly engaging, but it's one speaker, one topic, and then quick tips from teams. Uh, we have 30 minutes scheduled, but it should be more of like a, you know, 10 to 15 minute presentation with the rest being able to do discussions, taking notes, sharing best, you know, practices, answering questions from teams. And if you go to signupgenius.com backslash go uh, and then go to fin backslash fin live, that's the information and where you can actually sign up for certain sessions. As a note, they do close a few days before our actual presentation takes place and our plan is to confirm with everybody once we know you're a presenter. So you can follow us on social media. Um, these are a couple of the hashtags that you can use while we're in discussions and kind of going through these different pieces. Um, you know, we're getting ramped up a little bit more on LinkedIn. Um, we have those different you know, aspects of the program, but yeah. That's kind of where we are, just in terms of a, a group. I'm going to check and see if anyone has any questions. And do, do, do. And so it looks like a couple of people are answering the question about what brings you joy. Um, and so one of the, the answers, and I can um, just share it, and if the person feels comfortable talking more about it, that's totally fine. Um, but it's basically, you know, it brings me jo joy to show people the beauty of mathematics and computer science, especially if they can't see it for themselves. And I love that um, example of what brings you joy because when I talk with my students, a lot of times they don't understand that math and computer science, it's just, there are so many different ways to think about things and learn about things and you just need to find the best way for you. And there are, anyone can do mathematics there's no way you could be bad at mathematics. You just haven't found the pattern that works for your brain yet. Um, so I love that, that one. And then also another one was that it brings me joy to show students that they're capable of so much more than they think they are, especially when a student who is shy is using power tools and masters them and then can teach others. And so that sounds like uh, meant doing mentorship brings them joy. So I love that as an example too. And I think that's where doing this virtual community comes in to make sure that we have those different pieces. Um, Nick, I saw your question about, you know, find your why by Simon Sinek and the link that you sent over. If it's a big blue book with like find your why on it, yep, that's it. So that's the book that I referenced um, for those who are looking uh, for, you know, some good reading materials. Uh, this is the one that I was talking about. So find your why by Simon Sinek. Uh, and then, Yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. So I think at this point, I'd love to transition over to um, our roundtable topic about building a virtual community. And what do you want to see in these virtual conf 
conferences. And then also um, we're gonna do a gratitude exercise. So yeah, let's get started. I'm getting out my uh, notebook so I can take the very important critical notes. And um, we're going to let everyone here kind of be the responsible for unmuting yourself and sharing, but I definitely encourage you to do so. So what do you want to see in our virtual conference? And how about I'll lay the groundwork. So when we talk, we are talking about um, ideas and concepts. We're not here to endlessly spend time on the challenges that we are currently face. Uh, and so if it gets to a point where I feel like we need to transition on, on a topic or maybe someone, uh, you know, is really frustrated about something and instead of focusing on that challenge, we need to start finding solutions. Um, I will interrupt and we will, uh, can, you know, kind of continue on and essentially move the topic forward so that we can make sure that there is room in this roundtable discussion for everyone. So those are the ground rules. Uh, if you're talking too much, we may need to redirect uh, and make sure we're focused on solutions, not just and only on challenges. So what do you want to see in our virtual conferences? Well, I would certainly like to see uh, our teams, uh, students, mentors, et cetera, uh, step up and um, and kind of give up, dig into some of the things that they're doing in a more detailed way. For example, I'd love to see uh, a really good session on scouting. Um, I think year to year there are some specifics to the game, but ultimately I think uh, what teams are scouting from year to year are pretty similar. Um, and so how, you know, the, the importance of it, the depth uh, of it, and then, then the, not only the scouting, but then how are teams taking that data and what are they doing in the night between, um, what kind of meetings are they having, what are they talking about leading up to alliance selections. So that would be a good one. Yeah, Chris, you mentioned the uh, perspective on what do you do with the scouting data, uh, you know, on the night in between and I think that's really important for teams to understand uh, how that how that factors into the discussions you have how it factors into what you're looking for the next day uh, that that might provide more inspiration for teams in their scouting fantastic uh, I think it'd be cool to have some sort of session in which we discuss um, where half teams discuss what was kind of like almost the the turning point for them from when they became maybe like they felt like they took the next step in competitive level and what caused that change. So um, I know there's been a couple times that I've seen both as a student but also as a mentor where you where you change something and suddenly you kind of got to the next level. Um, and so I think it'd be very cool to have teams kind of share what they did in order to kind of take their team to the next level. So Malcolm Gladwell references um, this idea as like a tipping point. And so I, I think that that's a really cool concept. If you could like put that into like a condensed sentence, what would you think that would be? I think it would be, um, like it was, is it when was your tipping point or how did you get there? Or because? how did you get there? Yeah, okay. I think that's uh, how you got there. Um, what, what was the cause to lead to that tipping point? Got it. I like that. And what would you define, like how, how can you kind of define tipping point a little bit more? Like, is it just the next level of competition or? Let's get some phrasing better on that. Yeah, um, I, I would kind of be interested in see what other people think of it because it it's something I haven't well defined myself because it's almost at least right now to me anyway a feeling, um, which I am sure there is a better way to quantify it, but I'm not sure if I've had enough experience with working with different types of teams in order to quantify it beyond just a like, it feels better now. So 
how about instead of like surviving as a team, you're thriving? That's okay. it, yep. Thriving versus surviving. I love it. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think that could be a really fun roundtable. What do you think about potentially facilitating something on that? Yeah, I'd be, I'd love to do something where we kind of do some sort of a discussion on that. I can spend a small brief time talking about my own teams as kind of the intro starter and then have mm -hmm. other people go into what's kind of helped them, what's been the important things, especially with specific areas. Um, like, I know there's certain areas of our team that has kind of reached that tipping point before other parts, of course, so. Perfect. Awesome. I think that sounds great. Cool. All right. So, uh, so that's a great example. So in terms of building a virtual community, we want a round table talking about uh, turning points for teams. So how did they reach their tipping point? And, and that kind of means when did they start thriving instead of surviving? So, all right. Other contacts who are on here. I know there are some student board members. What do you want to see in a virtual conference? Um, and if you don't share, I'll call on you because I do have, your names are here. If I need, maybe I need to unmute people. Okay, Lucy, Lucy, I'm going to unmute you. Are you ready? Okay, hi, Lucy. Hi, We're Renee. Good? Okay, yeah. hi, what idea do you have? Any idea, no idea? Um, we were kind of talking about like ways, like I know as a board, we were talking about like ways teams excel and I was trying to fit like, choose like one person from like a specific team. Like I know like we're talking about like cyber tooth. They have this like amazing imagery and maybe finding like a head of like whoever is like their head of imagery and talking about like improving that on their team. Because like some teams you just kind of sit at a competition and you're like, oh my gosh, their imagery is so good how do we achieve that? And you don't really know like how to get there. Or another interesting thing would be like finances. Like I've heard from a lot of people that finances are really rough and finding like unique fundraisers. Like once again, Cybertooth, like they're doing, like they're selling scrunchies, like totally like these out of the blue ideas. So like talking about more unique things like that. Kind of, and like maybe we can expand off finances. I know it's almost like what entrepreneurial, mindset can you take on to figure out ways to like bring you know really cool things to the first community but then also like sustain your team yeah awesome okay so i'm going to come to devin next so devin would you like to unmute yourself all right <laughs> um well I, th I think lucy covered most of the stuff that we talked about um, but I think it would also be cool to focus roundtables around the different um, awards and have maybe like a chairman's presentation kind of thing or focus it more like that. Good. So we do, we already had a request. So before the end of the season, um, we had essentially a request for uh, people to come in and work on a chairman's chat and so we have a team that will, will take one of the uh, roundtable spaces in order to facilitate a chairman's chat um, and we'll make sure that you know obviously more contacts are kind of there um, but that was kind of a cool concept as well so from an awards point of view Devin what other sort of discussions do you think would be helpful like do you think you do you want to see mini presentations or are you looking for discussions or or something brand new like we kind of came up with these three concepts but we could do something a little different too yeah well i think presentations i mean i personally really like listening to presentations um and i think kind of a presentation on how to give a good presentation for the chairman's award would be like not just like what to do to be like a good chairman's team but like the presentation aspect good at the same time i think it's also probably beneficial that we have that discussion about what it takes to become a chairman's team or something along those lines because just from my personal experience is having to look back i have seen tons of fabulous presentation presentations how do you give a good presentation and they most of them have been absolutely wonderful and really beneficial but at the same time i feel like there's almost been a lack of 
what does it take to do the outreach to get there? Because someone's, there's so much focus almost on um, kind of that presentation, that one moment, because it's such an important moment. Um, but really talking about, you know, um, if let's say you took out the presentation aspect, you just wrote an essay and turned that in, how would you make sure that what your team is truly doing is becoming um, the best thing? Because ultimately, yeah, that's kind of my take on it too. It'd be nice to have that side of it as well. No problem. So I have a rather controversial viewpoint on it. Um, so for some background, before I moved to Indiana, um, I would mentor teams through storytelling and work with them on storytelling. And so um, in a three year period, I worked with four different FRC teams that earned five different chairman's awards. Um, and what I kind of identified through that and as I've gotten older um, is that the, these opportunities for you to share what you are doing that's honestly not like Carl, I think what you're getting to is that, you know, that's the end of a really long journey and the sharing of all these different pieces. But where did you start on the journey and what are you doing to truly impact students? Because that's really ultimately what this is all about. And so I would challenge the idea that we want to talk like, what does it mean to be a quote unquote chairman's team? Because what you're doing is impacting kids. And so I think we could maybe shift that question instead of what, which is chairman's, we could look at why and maybe say, uh, you know, how are teams impacting students? And I think okay. the other thing is too, like, even though the new chairman's like prompt or whatever is like mostly first focused, um, I think it's hard to define like what's the best outreach for every team to like get to that point. Um, we'll do things in different ways. So like it might be um, like for that discussion, it would be more of like a sharing of like how different people approach those outreach solutions rather than how to become a chairman's team. Because a chairman's team is a result of like all that hard work. 100%. So, so let's dive into that. So tell me more, like what do you think, so what do you think we're, we're kind of like asking questions about or where is that core question so we would probably if it is a chairman's chat we would probably structure it around the exact summary questions in the past five years how have your teams impacted so many teams past five years how many um how do you have your relationship with sponsors anything that first would consider valuable chairman's material so that you would kind of would you be searching for teams that have earned the award either in the past or this season to talk with or would you be talking with anybody I think it would have to be chairman's award winners okay because I think the award caters itself to a very specific type of outreach too mm -hmm. so maybe it's almost there's probably two aspects one is um this idea of what are you doing in the community like let's start with these executive summary questions let's dive down into them and then the other one is if if people want to share their presentations um and get feedback and what you know the different pieces that kind of happen in this chairman's chat uh then they can kind of go through that process and and it's almost like two different aspects maybe we'll figure it out but i like it that sounds great i like that you don't Move into the executive summary questions. Peter, did you have a comment? Yeah, if I may interject, um, maybe uh, address the question of how did you get to the point that you were reaching out to specific areas? How did you get to the point that you were reaching out to uh, sponsors? That way you can inspire the teams that aren't winning the chairmans to pick up their game. Oh, and maybe that comes, I feel like that really ties back to this tipping point idea that Carl came up with. But yeah, I like that a lot. That's great. Cool. All right. What else do we want to see? So uh, right now, just for those who have come in and out, uh, we are talking about what do we want to see in a virtual community conference? Uh, we haven't done this before. There are currently other regions who are executing on this idea as well, which is fun. Uh, but what can we do as our FinFam community? to kind of have these different pieces uh, and pull these together.
Well, to interject uh, quickly, I, uh, from a little bit of a selfish point of view, too, um, I think I talk to teams a lot about how growth of first is really got to be on our teams um, and less on first Indiana Robotics. Um, even though you know we serve in that growth role, uh, the best growth that we've seen over time has come from our teams. So it could be a session on, um, okay, wait a minute, how do you present to um, a neighboring school or group? Uh, how do you talk to people about how to start a team? And so I think get, providing the tools to the teams, uh, that could be something that, that I could lead a conversation on or we, um, uh, and we could also bring in a few people who have helped start some teams, uh, talk about what it is that they did um, and, and how they had that conversation uh, to help provide the tools necessary. Uh, and maybe that would energize the teams to say, oh, okay, well now we feel a bit more comfortable going to the next door school and, and encouraging them to do this. So. Absolutely, I love that idea. Um, and I think that I think that when you start, you stop talking about what, and you start talking about like how this actually happened or why, you know, why this happened, how you were able to execute on, et cetera. Um, you know, I think that's where you can make a really big impact. So I think that sounds great. Cool. Um, okay. To elaborate on Chris's mm -hmm. point, I think it'd be, and I'm not sure exactly where this fits in, um, but I'd like maybe some sort of talk on unique outreach opportunities um, coming from a very, FRC dense area. We're now at uh, five teams in the area. Um, it's 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 always, I think, a challenge to think of like new unique things to do. Um, and so that's kind of something that I think would be interesting too, is to to cover maybe a roundtable of oh, what's unique things you are doing, especially in the fact that well, social distancing is a huge thing now with virtual stuff. How do you deal with that? Absolutely. So, Devin, could you do me a favor? Um, I feel like the outreach up, the outreach that I have seen come through with like pieces related to Team Storm and the things that you personally have been involved with um, has been very unique. But I feel like it's because that you're asking, you're you're like literally going into the community and solving problems. Can you talk a little bit about like the Roy G. Biv calculator and then also? Um, the most recent where you did mentoring and then they came up with the sewer idea and how they're implementing that because those are super unique and I think the way you go about finding them are kind of interesting too and let me know if I need to unmute okay go ahead do you mean like just like what the what the projects are is that kind of what you want uh both so ex describe what the projects are but then also how did you come up with them because they are very unique yeah um, well, they were both um, our projects for First Lego League for Team Storm. Um, our Roy G. Bibb math system is a notebook app for students with dyslexia. Um, it's where they would complete all of their normal, normal homework, tests, assignments, etc. What makes it unique is that the numbers are color coded based on the rainbow pattern. So the ones place is always red, the tens and tenths are orange, the hundreds and hundreds are yellow and so on down the line in the rainbow pattern. So that way, if a child is trying to read a number correctly, but is mixing them around because of their dyslexia, they can see, okay, wait, I need all of the colors to be in the right order. So they're able to figure out what, um, what order the numbers should be in. Um, and our, our inspiration for that project is actually, um, it's a very unique story. Um, in, 20, in August of 2014, Henry Winkler, uh, the actor and author, was at Indiana State University giving a talk about his personal experience with dyslexia as growing up. Um, and our team went to go see his, his talk and we were just heartbroken by all the stories he was sharing. Um, he was, it was just all, all the shame he felt that he was sharing with us, it just, it broke our hearts. So we wanted to find a way to help kids never feel this kind of shame. So from there, we started consulting teachers. We started, um, we went to this um, school called Pinnacle School, which specializes in helping students with learning challenges. And we were talking to them. So reaching out to this population of people and trying to help them in 
a different way. Um, so yeah, that's the story with that one. Um, is that kind of what you were looking for, Renee? Oh, 100%. But I think, you know, Carl, the important part there is like, it's, you're not looking for outreach. You're literally going into the community and you're looking for problems to solve. Devin, would you kind of agree that that's one of the different, like, that between, okay. And so can you talk a little bit, um, I think that that's an important difference. And I think just to like kind of hit home, could you describe the like most recent example? So last year's uh, Affluent Challenge, or was it was the year before, was focused on water? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was two years ago. Um, mm, got it. Uh, hydrodynamics. And um, what I was mentoring Team Storm at that point because I had aged out. And um, the students were working with, um, they, they went and they toured our local um, wastewater um, treatment plant. And they were speaking with experts there, trying to find out just what problems they face on a daily basis. And they found um, really that um, the part of the job of the wastewater treatment plant, um, they have to try and get community involvement when it comes to resport, reporting um, spills and pollution around storm drains on, on curbs. And they have a lot of trouble getting people to report those spills and pollutions, um, but it's not really something they knew how to fix. They had ways to do it, but um, by uh, making a phone call or finding an online form, but it was very, um, it took a lot of time and it wasn't really convenient. So they found that people just weren't doing it. So what, Team Storm did is they came up with this little plaque um, and it has a QR code on it and they put them on storm drains. And so if you see a storm drain that needs to be cleaned for whatever reason, you can scan the QR code, take a picture of the drain and just send it off with one click of a button to the wastewater treatment plant. And then they will send their people out to go and clean the drains. So it's just a really easy way to get the community involved in helping out our environment. Carl, did you have any questions about that? No, I thought that was awesome. I'd love to you maybe make sure that we have a session that can talk a little bit more about that specifically, because I think that could benefit a lot of teams and a lot of students. I just know we're, we're right now in the growing phase. So um, maybe in a month or two from now, if we can get a bigger group of people, that'd be awesome to hear that reshared. Sure. And maybe yeah. maybe we can focus it around something like um, finding community challenges um, to solve. Uh, Lori, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think when Carl was talking about how to find something unique, um, I know Team Storm was always, they, they always said that the greatest challenge of any season was coming up with the problem to solve. And I know so many coaches at events when we would go to like Razorback or all these events where there is, you're competing against teams at that level where the project had to be pretty important to get to these international events. And people would ask us the question all the time is, you know, how did you get your kids interested and engaged in the project when all our kids want to do is the robot? And, uh, and our kids struggled just as much as that as any other group. It's just that I think they always came up with a good problem to solve. And it was because they went to the source. I think they were good at, at reaching out to the community and not trying to figure out the problem themselves because kids don't know often at that age what problems exist in their community. So don't just try to conjure it up on your own. Go to all of these experts within your community and their question would be kind of like, you know, eerily like uh, Renee's question that she asks everybody now is what, what problems do you have that we could try to solve for you? And sometimes that was met with a little chuckle because people think, oh, you're going to solve all my problems. But, you know, sometimes it actually worked out that way. So, um, so Carl, I think going to your community and saying what kind of outreach, you know, wh what problems do you have? And then find a way that maybe you could turn, morph that into an outreach event um, in some way. Yeah. Carl, maybe you and I can connect. I have some ideas on, on, on that where you could maybe get the students together and, go from there um, or maybe maybe one of the ideas is we could bring in a team and you could pre prep like a, a community you know maybe someone from like the Chamber of Commerce and you could literally sit down with them and say what problems are there in our city 
and they could talk about some of the challenges they feel comfortable sharing and you guys could see if you can narrow down different solutions and you could either do that on video or not on video um but yeah. that could be an interesting way to put that together and that and then depending on how that discussion goes you could always report out i want you discovered yeah and i would definitely say solving the problem was is probably one of the biggest questions we uh we started actually um when we saw this whole corona coronavirus thing going on and we weren't sure if pen was still going to happen we actually uh we had this huge like we're going to be the ones that like take the stand against it you know and uh we had kids solving problems you know how do we get people buttons without coming in physical contact and how do we um show people our binders without them you know getting in physical contact so i'm convinced our kids can definitely do it it's just i think solving that problem would be or finding the problem is something that um would be kind of a cool interesting session to have so lovely awesome okay um so i we have a couple people who have shared um either through renee encouragement voluntolding um or through actually volunteering information so i know there are a couple of people who haven't shared what they'd like to see out of these virtual communities we've talked a little bit about roundtable topics presentation sessions uh one of the other things you could talk about is is there anyone really neat in our community that you'd like to either ask questions to or learn more about like any cool mentors um cool topics you want to hear about i know i know one thing that i'd really love to hear about um you know i've been involved in flo for a long time now but i'm just a couple years into frc and uh, when i was an flo coach we spent so much of every meeting talking about core values. It came up literally in every meeting. And if it didn't come up on its own, we would find a way to bring it into the meeting and we would put the kids in awkward situations where they would be more likely to make mistakes so that we could then see them, maybe they weren't talking kindly to each other. Um, and we found a way to bring up core values and why this program, as Renee said, you know, it's the core values that define us and set us apart from other programs. I'd like to see, and I, and I meet these teams at the FRC level that totally embrace the core values also. And I wonder how does that happen when you have, you know, 20, 30, 40 people, how do you have those more intimate, you know, deep conversations about core values on that level? And I'd love to know, you know, I know that mentors can model that behavior and they kind of teach their students how to be gracious professionals just by modeling the behavior that they want to see. But I want to know beyond that, what else do you do to really make sure from rookies on up that they're coming into this program and they know what, the, what, what these are. So they're not just learning definitions of the core values, but they're knowing how to, you know, walk the walk. And, uh, and I know those, those teams are out there and I think it, it would be great to hear from them so that maybe other mentors can, you know, share those ideas. I love it. Well, and also just, um, I think in the FRC program and even FTC, like being able to really focus on um, like what are the core values, right? Um, I would, I maybe hang out with some FLO junior teams and every meeting at the start, the way we start the meeting is by doing a call and repeat of like what the first core values are. So that, and then you kind of, you go through the season, you can like ask them questions and go from there. So by the way, this is, you know, Sandy, my cat. So she decided she wanted attention anyway hi sandy <laughs> um can i suggest one other thing quickly absolutely when people first start talking is there any way you guys could like quickly identify like what program you're with and what team you're with because i realize there's some people with some wonderful ideas but i can't put a face or team to the name of who's talking so I mean, Carl, that just sounds like a brilliant idea that we should have started with as part of our rules of doing roundtables. So that sounds great. So I'm Carl. I'm from FRC team 1646. Cool. And FTC team 17012. Nice. I'm Renee Beckerblau. Um, I am the president of First Indiana Robotics. And this is Sandy, who is our... Um, a cat. I know it's not just us, Carl. It's fine. Hi, this is Nancy Becker, Renee's mom. <laughs> Thanks, mom. I see dad's here too. I don't know if he knows how to unmute. <laughs> Hi, 
Uh, this is Chris Osborne, Program Director for First Indiana Robotics. Uh, I started um, mentoring when my son was in FLL in the sixth grade, and I've been through uh, his high school team, so I've been a mentor at uh, FRC 1741 Red Alert Robotics for eight seasons. Cool. And my favorite season was Ultimate, uh, Ultimate Ascent. Yep. All right. Peter, do you want to yeah, introduce so this, yourself? Yeah, this is Peter Rargo. I'm a mentor on uh, FRC 1018, Bike Robo Devils. Um, I moved into the area 10 years ago and picked right up with the team. Nice. And ever since. Because <laughs> there's no exit strategy. No. No. Okay. Excellent. So, Priya, could you do an introduction? Hi everyone, I'm Priya. Um, I'm an alum off of 868 and now on 8232, helping my staff their team. Um, I help Renee out with chaos and I love hanging out with engineers and my favorite game, probably Power Up. Awesome, fantastic. Uh, Megan, can you introduce yourself? I'll mute. Here you go. Um, hi, my name is Megan Tobias. I'm an alum of FRC 2171 RoboDogs at Crown Point, and I also mentor FRC 6956 Shame Robotics. I'm currently living with Renee. <laughs> I have really cool roommates. It's exciting. Um, all right, so Devin. Hi, I'm Devin, of course. Um, I've been involved with FIRST since I was nine. I did six years of FIRST LEGO League with Team Storm. Then I did two years with of FRC with 5188, and now I am on Team 8232 Girl Gang. And I am on the Student Board of Directors for FIN. Perfect. And then Lori Langley? Hi, I'm Lori Langley. Am I unmuted? I think, am I on? Yep, you're good. Uh, so I coached first leg league team storm for eight years. So Carl, we know you well, if you didn't recognize the names, um, my kids always adored you and they went to the Purdue events. And I think we had dinner with you at one time in Lafayette at an Italian place. Um, and I'm now, <laughs> sorry, a first senior mentor uh, and enjoying that role. So. And I'll, I'll mute myself now since the dogs are broken. Sounds good. No problem. Uh, fantastic. Bryce, do you want to do a quick introduction, please? Yeah, sure. So my name is Bryce Kessel. I'm an alumni member of Team 868, uh, the Tech Hounds out of Carmel, Indiana. And then as of recently, I'm a Purdue First uh, Programs member working in their public relations department. Cool. Awesome. Uh, and then Anderson? Hey, I'm Anderson from 461. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. I'm VP and design team lead, I guess, and operator. No problem. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, Lucy? I'm Lucy. I'm also from 461. Um, I'm our head of media, and I am on the student board, and I do a lot of our outreach. Awesome. Uh, Nick? Nick Seidel. There, there we go. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. No problem. Um, I'm Nick Seidel. I'm with 2867. Um, I've been there for most of the last 10 years. Um, before that, I was a mentor with uh, 1646 the first three years they existed. I um, was a 461 my freshman year in college. And then I'm an alum of Team 448, which was a team in the Detroit area that has since gone defunct. Cool. And I got awesome. to coach my kids in FL, junior FLL this year. So that was a new door for me that I first got involved with this year. Exciting. That's amazing. I love it. All right. Uh, Pam? If you'd like, you can do a quick introduction. We can also unmute. There we go. You're good. I had to figure out how to do that. Uh, I'm Pam Bessler. I am a mentor for the Quadrangles, 3494. I also have been an FLL mentor for even longer than that, uh, both for my son and then now with the Boys and Girls Club here. 
Nice. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, and then uh, Sam or Samantha? Yeah, I'll go by Sam. Um, I'm Sam oh, Perfect. I'm from um, Team 3176, right of Brown Indiana. Um, I'm our team's project manager, so I um, look over everything on the team to make sure everything's running smoothly. Fantastic. And then um, Isaac, I saw you came in a little bit later. Uh, we are just doing some quick introductions um, so everyone knows, you know, kind of who's on the call and where they're from because we were sharing such great ideas for the roundtable. Um, but Carl pointed out we hadn't done introductions. So if you can unmute and share your background, that'd be great. I can also unmute. There we go. So, Isaac, you are unmuted if you would like to talk. JK. All right, sounds good. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at and what we're up to. Um, so, continuing along with our question, you know, Carl, you kind of interjected with a really critical and important piece of uh, the puzzle. Um, I know you all have like mentors or role models in the first program that you guys look up to. Who would you like to hear from? Like we can literally ask any of them, to, anyone to engage with us. Do you, does no one have role models? I would add that um, I would also think beyond FIRST Indiana Robotics. So if there's somebody within the world of FIRST um, that you all would like us to try to bring on, uh, somebody from headquarters, or uh, we can always ask. They can certainly say no, um, but, um, you know, Hall of Fame mentors or Woody Flower winner mentors, people like that, if there's somebody you've seen from a distance and thought, wow, I'd like to hear from them, uh, ask us and, and I'll certainly do the asking. And Yeah. Well, you know, and Don, um, you know, he's no longer president of FIRST, but like he's a really cool person and he's got some free time. Uh, he's not, you know, judging at any events currently, obviously. So uh, we could always ask him if he could come on and just talk about like, what's it like being president of FIRST? What was your favorite part? That'd be cool. All right, I'm writing that down. Um, Al Skirkowitz, and I may have butchered his name, apologies. Mm -hmm. I think he'd be a really interesting person to hear from, possibly Richard Wallace. Okay. They might be a little more technically oriented, but I think they'd be worth listening to. Deal. I like it. Um, something, someone I might be interested in hearing from, and I don't know why I'm interested, uh, but I think there was a guy from 1024 two years back called Jason who moved to Ohio or something like that. And at the time when I was a student, I remember there was like a big deal about him moving and how he was an awesome community member in Indiana first, but I don't know why I never knew why. So maybe him. Yes. I think that sounds great. Maybe our board members could engage. Um, I, I'm looking forward to explaining to Jason. Jason, that one. That's good. Priya, do you have any ideas? Yeah. Um, the head coach on 868, Mr. Bonowit, um, just like he's been like a really important person in my life, but he also like, I think 868 is the biggest team in Indiana. And I feel like managing a team of that size for so many years and being so successful is something to definitely care about. I agree. Is there anyone from like not this state that you'd like to hear from? Yes. <laughs> like who? Um, probably uh, Libby Kamen would be cool. Uh, Karthik I second. From eleven fourteen would be cool, or IFI or wherever he's going right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Katie from two fifty three from Chief. She seems really cool. Uh, like Katie. K okay. Yep. She was just in town. Sounds good. We can do that. Um, All right. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we start with those? We can always go from there. Yeah. Love it. All right. Are there any other mentors anywhere in the first community that y'all would be interested? Yes. I have a friend. Um, she's on a team in Pennsylvania, 1640 Sabotage, and they are a really, really impressive team. 
And so I could, I could talk to her and see if any of their mentors would be interested in speaking about something because they're a very well-rounded team in all aspects. They're very, very impressive. I love it. I think that sounds great. I'd like to throw in that I'd like to hear from 708 um, Catters Robotics because uh, they have some really cool branding that they've done to the point where their school like adopted the like their logo like they helped the school rebrand with the logo that they use like it was very impressive so from a branding point of view they also do some really cool um, cross program engagement that could be fun What about like, I mean, we have a lot of companies in the state that we could talk to people from. Um, you know, Andy Baker will be coming on a little bit later today. Um, what other, any other suggestions or people or teams or anyone's that you'd like to hear from? Are there like com people from certain companies you'd like to hear from? I have friends at Google. I just went on a Google tour. Uh, we have a contact that says they'd like to hear from um, 7457 about anything specific. FTC engineering notebook organization and layout. Love it. That sounds great. We know someone at, uh, who works as an engineer at Disney. He's a, a, uh, he's a first senior mentor now, Andy Maluzzi. He's a former Rose Holman alum and he started Team Storm. So we are in debt to him forever. I bet we could get him to talk about what he's doing at Disney and how he finds time to mentor so many first teams down in Florida. Love it. Um, we had a couple uh, contacts who were going to come in for the state championship that were from like a lot of different companies. So we could always ask them if they could talk about what they do and why they do it. Uh, Peter, did you have an idea? Uh, a couple other ideas. Um, there's a guy by the name of Larry Matthews out of JPL. He's a, a vision expert out there, but he's well, well rounded in robotics. Um, he's, uh, he's kind of been a community leader in the unmanned ground vehicle area. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't talked to him for years, but he's still out there, I think. Cool. Um, and uh, one of the universities <clears throat> that I've always looked up to is Carnegie Mellon University and the Robotics Institute. Um, I just quickly checked on the contact I had there, Chuck Thorpe. I didn't see him on LinkedIn, uh, but I I'm sure that somebody out of the Robotics Institute would be uh, an interesting uh, person to give a talk on maybe a project that they did. Cool. All right, I like that, that sounds great. So these are a lot of good ideas. Um, for those who have just recently joined us, we are working on identifying potential contacts, companies, mentors that we'd like to hear more about. Um, we have a couple suggestions in the chat, including you know, Dean Kamen. Um, there's a NASA contact that typically judges the Wisconsin Regional that we could potentially invite to speak. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, good, good concept, love it. Uh, do you guys, like, are there any universities you'd want to hear from? I mean, we can, again, sky's the limit. We're, we're, this is brand new. This is for you all. So what do y'all want? Let's make it happen. Um, you don't even have to ask these people. We can ask them. Yes, Nick? Let's say we had a recruiter from uh, Kettering University come down and talk to us um, just towards the beginning of build season. Um, I could dig out her contact information because she had a lot of good information on kind of some of the scholarships and things they offer up that way. Um, the other thing I was thinking about would be a good guest speaker on one of these would be um, at Penn last year, they had a couple reps from Valkyrie and from Huge from BattleBots. It'd be interesting to kind of listen to them, maybe talk about what their design process is like and how they got started with BattleBots and, you know, what experience they have going into it from FRC or whatever they did prior to going into BattleBots. I like that. Yeah, so you could call up our fun, fantastic visitors and see if they'd be willing to chat. Maybe there are a couple other contacts that we might be able to grab. Um, I know that Katie could also talk about being on a, a uh, go-kart team, so that could be fun. Priya? Um, the, oh my god, I can't believe I just forgot. Oh, Salesforce in Indiana. I feel like that would be a really good one, because I feel like they're kind of just like, I mean, like, they're not like Google, but like, they're a huge company that's like super important, so. They are a huge company that's super important. I wonder who we could get from there. 
Um, oh, we'll send an invitation and we'll make, we'll see what we can get done, but I love it. I think that sounds great. Cool. All righty. Well, so, I don't know if, if the community would be interested in uh, hearing from or talking to some people in the racing industry. Uh, I've certainly got some contacts with uh, people on um, a couple of the race teams, plus a couple of drivers, uh, but also maybe some inside team people that are engineers who actually work on the cars and things like that. That that might be a, and we might even be able to take a look at at a um, maybe a virtual tour of Ooh, all the shops. That could be amazing. Maybe our friends at Andretti, we could yeah. reach out to them and ask them about that too. I love okay. it. Fantastic. Okay. So, I mean, these are a lot of great ideas. Uh, we have a couple more minutes here before we are going to go into a break and then transition into our uh, presentations with people who are, will hopefully come back. My roommate who isn't here right now. So we'll see how that goes. All right. So virtual community conference, virtual anything. Um, I mean, I can start throwing out like general concepts like, okay, if you could do, if you had to do a TED talk, what TED talk would you work on? I personally, if I had the time to put one together, I think I'd want to do one on ergonomics uh, and the size of tools and how uh, they are not built for small hands and like research about that. I would just think it'd be fascinating. And I think I have a lot of content I can work on. Priya, what do you, what would you present on? Um, well, I was going to say, like, the SBOD had an idea that we should do, like, a virtual forum. So yeah. um, if you guys would be interested, like, it would have to take, like, people interested to make it work. Yeah. But, like, um, if there's any, like, like, kind of how Purdue forums went, but virtually, like, have different teams present seminars on things. Like, um, for example, like, I know 868 is really good at CAD. And... 39, uh, 3494 is just amazing at control systems and like 3940 is like an imagery team and like have different teams talk about what they're really good at and maybe teach some sort of skill, tutorials. I don't know. I don't really know how it's going to work, but if anyone's interested, we'd love to make a thing like that work. Just kind of like, since we have so, so much free time, taking this time to like learn and refine our skills even better will make us better prepared next year. I feel like you are so inspiring because you're one of those students who's like, I would like to learn things and not just play video games all the time. I love it. Okay. So uh, for the group here, every single one of your robotics teams does like cool stuff. Every single one of you has the ability to like speak about things or find someone on your team who enjoys speaking. What would you like to present on? Congratulations. You've all been roped into the forums. Look at I have a different colored pen. It's red. I like programming, so I'd probably talk something about that. Carl, programming. But what's like something unique that your team's up to? Um, well, uniquely right now, we're working on um, a couple of different things. The students are working, we want to design some sort of uh, way of teaching. Um, in order to better teach our students in the future. We're also working on, um, which is more of a me type thing I'm doing myself, um, but designing um, a virtual uh, robotics um, or a virtual kit to try and be able to program robots without actually having to have a robot there for you, um, which is something we're touching on. Also, we just finished a bunch of motion profiling and, um, like auto vision tracking using vision software and stuff. So um, love it. Yeah. Stuff Virtual like robotics programming kit. I think that would be really cool to chat about or even like ask people what their thoughts are with it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. I like it. Uh, fantastic. Okay. So that's 1646. So congratulations. You know, you guys have a topic that you can adjust. Of course, this isn't mm -hmm. permanent red ink, but it could be, but maybe it's not. Maybe we'll be flexible because those who are flexible will not break. Priya, what do you want to present on? Um, 
I don't know. Uh, I guess probably something business or operations related or maybe outreach. I don't know. I've done a lot of like not first outreach, but general STEM outreach. Um, yeah, I don't know. General STEM outreach, businessy stuff. Cool. Do that. All right. I've put down those general words together by your name. So yeah. we will, we will identify what your chat is about. Yeah. Cool. All right, Lucy. Something that I really like that I guess 461 has started doing is unified and that mm -hmm. like specific like thing. Um, we have, we finished our second season of hosting unified robotics. Um, and we kind of made our own game and making it more like first related and it's just catering to a new sort of minority because our team like we've done outreach focusing on like people of color and outreach focusing on like girls and stuff like that and we wanted to focus on a new type of minority that's often overlooked and we changed we developed a different program than the national program because we wanted something that's more engaging so Lovely. unified is is something that i personally am really passionate about and i know quite a few other 461 students are really passionate about love it let's make it happen cool fantastic uh devin because i'm picking on the student board um well i mean i definitely want to consult with my team maybe we can come up with something together but being on 8232 this year, uh, we're the only, currently the only all-female FRC team in Indiana, so I feel like we could do something about women in STEM. Cool. And the importance of that. Cool. Fantastic. That sounds awesome. I have some other ideas on things that you could potentially do as well. Okay. Absolutely. But we'll talk more about that later. I like it. All right. Um, Sam, so I know you're only a weekend. But I figure Brownsburg probably has some cool things they do, including like what your position is on the team and some other ideas. So Sam, what do you got? Yeah, I think after um, examining our past season, I think the way we lead our team, like just our team is extremely, extremely student led, um, which I think is a lot different from a lot of other teams. Like the students make most of the team's decisions. And so I just think a student leadership talk could be something our team is a lot could talk about. Cool. Awesome. And what, can you talk a little bit about what your, your position is on the team and how it's structured? Okay. So I'm my team's project manager, which basically means that, um, I, I have, I run what we call our SAB, our student advisory board, which is seven kids, um, on the team that make most of the team's decisions. We have outside of meeting meetings where I lead and we talk about all different facets of the team and I make sure that everything is um, going as planned. I create schedules, I create like a lot of the cross team coordination and how um, our outreach is doing and a lot of stuff like that is like the, cul the culmination of that is like my role, I guess. And everybody, everybody else, like we have a chief engineer and outreach lead and a business lead and um, a lot of other positions on that board that cover everything else on the team, but my job is like to bring that all together. Sweet. That sounds great. Hi, Andy. Uh, I see you in the chat here. So you have to connect though, or you could do it on your computer. Uh, I'm sure Danny is troubleshooting right now. Okay, everybody. So uh, one last piece that I just want to talk about. So we're going to take a quick 15 minute break, but I wanted to mention the fact that um, Gratitude is really important. And so uh, the reason, so essentially being thankful for things. Um, so Danny, if you can walk that way, thank you. Um, <laughs> so in terms of being grateful um, and those different pieces, one of the ways to kind of um, work through this whole isolation piece that we're working through and to remember how to socialize with people is to think about uh, things that you're grateful for. And so as an example, I am really grateful for these different pieces. Um, Danny, can you just go that way? I'm sorry, like, okay. Anyway, Danny is now talking outside of the room. Um, anyway, so yeah, great gratitude, things that they're grateful for, peace and quiet. I am grateful for these things, wonderful. 
Um, so what I'd like to do, we're going to take a little break, and then at 5.30, uh, we're going to come back here. Danny is going to chat with us about space and other Q&As, so hopefully get your space questions ready. Um, I know it'll be a uh, pretty um, rapid fire, uh, you know, back and forthy, energetic. We might need to, like, zoom the camera back and go from there. Uh, and then he's going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, he's going to use the team tips time to talk a little bit about some Andy Mark uh, related tips. Um, that and how his team has kind of used different pieces and stuff like that and then we're going to conclude by chatting with andy baker and bringing him in um for our essentially closing session um and go from there so that's our plan uh so as you leave if one and slash don't you don't really need to leave you can just like mute yourself and leave your phones and like you know take a quick break and grab some food and go from there um and i'll still be here just kind of monitoring things and ask answering questions but if one of the things that you could specifically do uh, is think about and be ready to put in the chat when you come back, um, what is something that you are grateful for? I promise everyone will feel better if you think about it. I literally have like a gratitude jar downstairs where I like write little notes about things I'm grateful for. Um, and I think it's really important and really awesome. So if you could do that, that'd be great. So feel free to take a quick break. Uh, again, I'm leaving the chat open um, and we'll go from there. Name. Hi, Haley. Just as an FYI, uh, we currently have our contacts on mute, uh, and we are um, about to, at 5.30, start our space session. So it's going to be really awesome. Also, Pam, I've definitely gotten that recommendation before, but I am very excited to read that book and learn more about seatbelts and how dangerous they are. All right. So Haley, I'm going to put you on mute, um, just as an FYI. Uh, and then once you get everything set up, we'll be good to go. But just wanted to give you a quick heads up. There we go. You're good.
Ha ha, there you go. Danny, you're in. I know there's a weird echo. You are currently muted. We break the internet. You're, you're unmuted. Hi, everybody. Everybody else is on mute. Hi, Megan. I uh, I just saw that. Uh, hopefully, I made a correction there. Uh, if there's any Michaels on the call, if there's any Michaels on the call, if you could drop something in chat, any Michaels on the call, this concludes our mic check. That's not my joke, but I'm so happy somebody told me about it on the uh, early GA call.
That's not a high-res photo. That's a very terrible photo. It's quite awful. All right. All right, well, it's 5.30, so I think we should just like go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so I get uh, a half an hour thereabouts to talk to you guys about space. So uh, if any of you guys have seen me do this or this up thereabouts at uh, the Purdue Forum event, um, that's kind of what I'm looking to do here. So kind of keep it really quick, really lively. So um, I will try real hard to answer questions. Um, so if you guys leave those uh, in the chat, we can kind of get to those pretty quick. Um, and we'll, we'll just kind of keep it moving. So we'll try to go real fast and kind of keep it um, just flowing real nice. Um, so background on me with regards to the space stuff. Um, I got my degree from the University of Minnesota in aerospace engineering. I did, I uh, worked for about, a, about six months as an intern and then a year as a um, full-time engineer at a company uh, just outside of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, where we put thermal insulation blankets on satellites. So if you ever see pictures of satellites or like the Apollo moon landers or any kind of cool stuff like that, uh, it has sort of that like aluminum foily looking, uh, you know, stuff wrapped around it, either gold or, or aluminum kind of silvery color. Um, that's the sort of stuff that we manufactured, um, but we did it predominantly for satellites. Um, so the cool thing that that does is satellites whip around the earth. Um, so like satellite in low earth orbit, goes around the earth every 90 minutes um, in the, when it's getting hit by the sun, they get up to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And when they're in the shadow of the planet, they get down to about minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about a 500 degree temperature swing uh, every 90 minutes uh, for the 10 to 15 year lifespan of the satellite. And so if anybody's ever taken a thermodynamics class, you'll know that that kind of sucks. Uh, and so um, satellites, need to do something with that heat because computers and like telescopes and optics and sensors really want to operate at something much more narrow um and so lots of cool different things you know were you know are at play there to make sure that those things work right um oh hello tech support thank you very much Would you like to share no i just have pictures of the galaxy <gasps> renee gave me the power to share my screen so if we need to do that we'll do that um, and so, um, so the, the satellites, um, uh, okay. So there's no atmosphere. There's no, there's nothing touching the satellite. So convection and conduct and conduction, uh, no convection and yeah, they can't conduct any heat and they can't convect any heat away from, it took me a minute, um, away from the, the satellite. Um, and so the only way that they can absorb or remove heat is through radiation. Um, and so. The reason they're very, very shiny is so that they can bounce back a lot of the radiation um, that comes at them from the sun. Uh, and so um, like the space station, other stuff that don't look like metallic or shiny, um, they're typically made with a, the, the outer covering is a thing called beta cloth, which has a lot of Teflon in it. And Teflon has a very high reflectivity. Um, and so it's not quite operating on the exact same principle, but it is still rejecting away a lot of um, infrared and, and radiation away from the vehicle um, and actually fun fact if you um, look at you know pictures of the international space station you'll see you know the, the really big solar panels and then 90 degrees to those you'll see these big white panels sort of going off the other direction those are radiators that are blasting heat out into space and removing it away from the, the space station to keep it at its correct operating temperature um so that's some really cool stuff um 
and uh, and so those and so the the blankets that we built for satellites they were a whole bunch of different layers um usually about you know 12 to 20 or so layers and the the big thing that they did um you know is again bounce away the, all that radiation and had to be a bunch of different layers so that as each one of them you know as as each one of them rejected most and but let a little bit through the next layer would reject that next little bit um and so a lot of the aluminum foils and things that we use um like we actually use some aluminum foils except they're about 16 times thinner than the stuff that you buy at the grocery store so um some really crazy crazy thin um very very aerospacey like like the pinnacle of the, the crazy weird obnoxious stuff that the aerospace industry does to save weight and who cares about cost so it's it just a really kind of a weird paradigm of of how we would go about building these blankets um but like any engineering job right we had to quote things we had to come in on time under budget um and do all that kind of fun stuff and so we had to do lots of process improvement and all that kind of fun stuff as well um so so from doing all of that i you know that's kind of my my a lot of my knowledge base and my stuff around um space and i you know it's still a very big passion and hobby of mine so um I like a lot of people. I watched the um, most recent SpaceX launch, um, and so that was kind of nifty. They flew a booster for the fifth time, which is ridiculous. Um, back when I was going to school, they hadn't yet landed a booster, so they're still only barely talking about reusing boosters. And even still, that was still a crazy thing to even sort of talk about and sort of theorize about. Um, and now they're doing it routinely, so it's it's just kind of nutty. Um, and even on the the latest the, the latest SpaceX launch, the Starlink launch, um, the two fairing halves that are up that were protecting the the satellites, um, those were reused from the last time that uh, from from previous flights. Um, and I believe that was the first time that they had flown uh, second second use fairings. Um, it's, it's much more recently that they've started catching uh, the the fairings and now have a small I think stockpile of those that they can now refly. Um, so they're doing lots of really, really cool stuff. So lots of really neat things still happening on, um, you know, sort of on the space front. So, um, I'll keep rambling away unless we have some questions here in the chat room. I don't see anything. Um, because I'm trying to monitor the chat and talk to you guys, if you put things in all caps, it'll help me kind of, you know, see what's, uh, what's going on here. Um, so we're, uh, we'll keep going there. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the news that uh, um, NASA and JPL had a bit of an issue with uh, one of their, uh, with the InSight lander, the thing that landed on Mars uh, just relatively recently. It had a, a drill probe that got stuck. Uh, and so it also has, I think it's like a secondary arm that has like a little shovel scooper thingy on it. So they use the shovel scooper to whack the drill. Um, so that, that way uh, they could get the drill free and, and keep playing around on, on Mars and keep doing cool science. But like, it really goes to show like that, the team at JPL that does like the, the Insight Lander and Curiosity and Spirit and Opportunity, those people are some insanely clever and crafty people. They are very, very good at, at keeping those things very functional and, and, and operational. Um, they like, when Spirit got stuck, they did a bunch of science right around there when opportunity started like having parts fail and fall off and do the thing um they uh they, they were able to keep doing a bunch of science on that you know with, with with that rover so those people over at jpl they are some really clever people and like a lot of them are uh first alums and first mentors and first people so like they bring a lot of that to the the first world i'm seeing from uh what would it take to create a uh, a earth to space elevator Ooh, that's a very good question. Uh, this is a, a crazy kind of like ridiculously cool notion of a uh, space elevator. One, it would have to be on the, the, the Earth anchor point would have to be on the equator. Um, you would need a rather large like meteor asteroid kind of a thing um, out in geostationary orbit. So 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface. Um, where like your direct TV and, and you know, your, your any satellite communications, all those things are, are living out in geostationary orbit. Um, and so the cool part about geostationary is it is a thing that uh, orbits at the same rate that the Earth spins. And so it always, that satellite, or in this case, our captured asteroid, stays at the exact same spot over the ground as the Earth rotates, which for a space elevator would be very important. 
Um, you don't want those two points moving with respect to one another because otherwise they would just, you'd break your space elevator. Um, so elevator is a little bit the wrong kind of terminology. It would really be more sort of like a space ribbon or space cable. Um, it would be under an unbelievably phenomenal amount of tension. Um, and then the car, the, the elevator car, the cable car, would just sort of ride on that cable and propel itself up and down. But it could do it with like an electric motor as opposed to rockets or crazy junk like that. Um, and so they definitely, they'd have to have the, the thing anchored out at geostationary. Um, and then there'd probably be a, a, a space station at the traditional um, 220 mile, give or take, low Earth orbit that like the International Space Station is at right now. Um, because that's where it, it would, why go all the way out to the asteroid when you can do all the science that you want to do, you can do all the cool stuff that you want to do in low Earth orbit. Um, and then that way the trip is only like 220 miles straight up as opposed to 22,000 miles. Uh, your, your travel time is just way, way shorter. Um, so yeah, so that, that's what a, a space elevator would look like. Um, but it would, and there's some really cool pictures on the internet of like uh, um, people who have Photoshop and like Photoshop artists um, who have put together renderings of what it would look like, like having a space elevator be sort of off on the horizon. Um, and they're really neat, nifty looking pictures because there's just sort of like this like funny thing. Like it, it just, it, they, look, they look really, really cool. Um, so definitely see if you can go check some of those out. Um, but yeah, that was a good question. Anybody else have any questions? No. All right. Um, what else is in news of space? Wait, did you hear how the, the robot had to hit itself in order to get unstuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you talk about that, Rich? When I asked if we had talked about the robot smacking itself, and it's, well, it wasn't in space, but it smacked its one drill with its other double to get itself unstuck. So, um, yeah. Is there life on other Earths? Is there life on other Earths? Uh, you probably, at this point, the answer is most likely probably. Um, and there's two really interesting sort of, uh, descriptions of, of something. So there's the, there's the Drake equation, which is just sort of like a, a mental exercise to kind of walk through. Um, but it basically talks about like the number of stars and the number of galaxies, and then like the num the odds that you know a star has you know uh, you know planets. The odds that those planets are in the habitable zone around the star, um, and and there's some other terms um, that kind of go through and look at it. But there is you know there are and something like billions of stars in the galaxy and there are trillions of galaxies in the visible universe and so the number of stars that are are really out there is just a phenomenally huge number um and there's a lot of really cool science being done right now with um the the hunt for exoplanets so those are planets orbiting stars not our own um and the the more that they have these new sort of tools and these new space telescopes and, and various things where they can look for planets around other stars, the more that they keep finding them. It is the thing where they are starting to realize that it is the odds are more likely that there are planets around stars than no planets around stars. Um, so that's a term in the Drake equation that now we have a, a fairly good understanding of. Um, you know, at, at a very high level, we can say that you know there's more often than not that there are planets around those stars. You can then sort of apply like, okay, well, how many of them are habitable? Um, and then there's sort of a second term that, okay, there, there's sort of another pair of sort of interesting sort of constraints that you need to have around a planet in order to, for it to have life. One is you need that planet to be around, to have been around in its solar system for a long enough time to be stable, to be cool. So like there's a point in the Earth's history where it was being, bombarded with asteroids and meteorites and it, like basically the whole surface of the earth is just you know molten rock and lava and, and like dude, that's not a place to support life um, but then the planet sort of collected all of the debris around our sort of celestial neighborhood um, and there's no you know like it's not just a, a nebula it's not like a, a, a giant expanse of stuff like we've cleared out our neighborhood um, and uh, and now our planet has cooled and the surface temperature has, has solidified and it's stabilized and it is, it is more consistent now. 
Um, and so you need that sort of thing to set up for quite a while um, in order to sort of create, you know, the, the, the conditions where life could, you know, sort of come from. Um, and, but like some of their really early, um, uh, some of their, they're starting to find some really early things where they say like, almost from the very beginning of when the earth was cool and solidified and stable, like the first single cell you know, organisms came about in astrological time frames, insanely short. So like we had, we, we had sort of life on earth almost sort of from the very beginning, um, which is not something that would have been predicted. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the requirements that you need to have sort of life on other planets. Um, one of the other things that you need to have, and this is where it gets really, really sort of like heady. It's, it gets really kind of kooky. The only way for complex life, the only way for their, the only way for this sort of thing to exist um, with the entire, with the full sort of periodic table that we have is if we came, is if our sun formed, our sun formed in a nebula that was created by a supernova or the dying guts of an exploding star that, you know, spewed itself, you know, all across, you know, our, our celestial neighborhood. Um, because that is the only place in the cosmos where you can get heavy elements, heavier than like carbon-ish. Um, and so a star can, turn, you know, like our star is a main sequence star in the middle of its lifespan. It's right now turning hydrogen into helium. Uh, once it runs out of hydrogen, it'll start turning the helium into four. What's four? Is it, that, it, what's number four on the periodic table? Oops, oops. You're watching people Google things right now. This is the most entertaining web content in the world. Um, beryllium. Yeah. So you can take... You can take two helium and turn them into beryllium and you can, you know, fuse some other stuff together and you can maybe get up to like oxygen or whatever. Um, but like those, you can kind of sort of make those first couple on the, the periodic table just through stars doing fusion. Um, but at a certain point, that doesn't work anymore. You can't have any of that stuff anymore. And the only way, the only place where you get enough pressure and enough heat and enough stuff to happen to create all of the heavier elements that we see on the periodic table, the stuff that creates us, that allows us to sort of, you know, be what we are, is in a supernova. So you have to have a, a planet in, you have to have a planet orbiting in the right, in the Goldilocks zone, at the right distance away from the sun, orbiting a second generation star that formed in the nebula of a supernova, because that's the only place that you can get, um, you know, sort of the complex, you know, atomic structures that you see in, in the world like this. Otherwise, you'd have everything would just be made out of like helium and hydrogen and, and the, the very most basic things. And so like when people talk about, when you hear like Neil deGrasse Tyson and other people talk about, like, we are the children of stardust, that is absolutely the case. There's no other way that we could be, you know, the, the, the complex, you know, uh, a, atomic structures that we are had we not come from the exploding guts of a dying star. So like, it's kind of a weird goofy way to, you know, and it gets like really sort of big brain and sort of like heady and, and whatnot. But it, to me, it's one of the coolest parts about astrophysics and like kind of wondering like our place is sort of in the universe. All right, that was a really like long answer to it. Um, okay, so kind of a following question from Carl. Hi, Carl. Um, is there a life out there and will we ever be able to communicate with it? Uh, will we all build it? I would say yes. And that's just solely from a point of pure optimism. Like I, I would see no reason why we wouldn't be able to communicate with it. Um, there is so, like, we, we can communicate effectively with, with lots of different, you know, things like species, animals, different things like here on earth. Like, um, you know, people commonly talk about like chimpanzees are only 3% genetically different from us. And we're like, we can't have a conversation, but we can teach them sign language and like we can, we can be able to like know what's sort of going on. Um, and like, you can teach your dog tricks. You can say, hey dog, go do the thing. And the dog like, go do the thing, comes back and expects a treat. Like there's definitely communication going on there. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll totally be able to communicate with aliens. Will it take some time? Of course, it takes the time to learn any new language. And any being that is technologically 
and sociologically ad advanced enough to build starships worthy of traveling interstellar space and coming this way, um, like they probably have some form of language and we'll probably be able to figure it out. Other fun fact, um, like if they're coming this way, it's because they know we're here and it's probably because that they've been able to see the hundred plus years of radio waves that we've been blasting out, you know, into the cosmos. Um, and so the, the radio sphere around the earth is about a hundred light years, give or take, you know, in, in all directions. So all of the stars and all the planets that are within a hundred light years have started to hear our radio transmissions. And if they've started to decipher them, then they can start to figure out our languages and, and they can start to figure out how, you know, we, we communicate. So they may land here on earth being able to speak one or multiple of you know earth's major languages which i mean like okay that's not how it's depicted in the movies but that would be just like a really crazy way for the whole thing to happen. carl i see like from that smirk i, I think there may be a follow-on question but we can also unmute yeah we can do that what up bryce So we're we're taking questions from the, the the chat group. So if anybody's got any questions that they want to uh, throw up, you know, we've had some we've had Mason and Bryce jump in here uh, just a minute ago. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Renee had a question. It was who's a personal role model of mine? Um, that is that's a tricky question. Um, the uh, the, the the very true answer, and this is not just simply because I, I can see them here on the chat room, um, like, hi, mom. Um, I, I, I got a lot of, you know, some, some, like, obviously, like a lot of us, like, we learned so much from our parents. And so, like, you know, that's one. Um, who's other role models of mine? Um, you know, you can think about that when you ask questions or follow up. Oh, cool. Thanks for the distraction. Um, so does this mean that if aliens landed on our planet today, knowing our languages, then they might be speaking like they were from the 1920s? Um, good question. So, yeah, so we've been, so we've been blasting our radio sphere out and, you know, go, going, you know, signals traveling outbound from Earth. So if you were on an alien planet, say, a hundred light years away from Earth, then you'd start, then you would just now be starting to get the very first transmissions from from earth the very first things you know that 100 years ago left earth and were flying out into the cosmos but then you know in the same way that you know day by day we get the next you know episode of the tv program and we get the next you know season of the thing as time goes on on that far off alien planet they would start to get you know the next radio drama and then eventually you know sort of like the next you know the the, the first tv signals and then you know, they'd get TV shows and, and they'd sort of work their way from Leave it to Beaver to I Love Lucy and, you know, all the way through, you know, the, the TV library of Earth. Um, and they would just get it at like a, a 100 year delay from when it originally sent out. But as they start to, you know, fly towards Earth, they would start say they're going half the speed of light. Well, now they'd start to hear the whole thing on, on double time. Um, and so by the time that they landed here, they'd be able to pick up the, the radio signals that were just now being broadcast. They, they still wouldn't have that delay. So they would, as they fly this way, they would see the, the radio waves come in uh, red shifted and, um, you know, at, at double time or, or however fast, you know, compared to how, how fast they were going. So. Well, cool beans. Um, ah, more questions are always good. What's your favorite star? What's my favorite star? <laughs> um, my favorite star or constellation or, or planet? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know the name. Um, Renee, can you look up the star? The, the star? Yeah. Yeah. 
Star doesn't have a name yet. Um, okay, so like I was talking about earlier in the hunt for exoplanets and, and the, the right, planets around other stars, uh, there's a very odd star that they found. Normally they find planets around stars by looking at the point of light from that star and then as the planet transits in front of that star, right? If here's a star, the planet transits between us, which is the, the detector here, and, and that star. So we will only be able to see a certain fraction of the planets and the other out there in the world because their orbital plane has to be tipped towards us. But given the vast number of stars that are out there in the galaxy, uh, we can see lots of planets. Um, so as that planet transits in front of the star, the amount of light that our detector sees from that star dips. And so we're able to measure that dip and we're able to say, okay, if that star dips by that much that fast, we're able to figure out how big the planet is and, what, and because orbital dynamics is insanely, insanely consistent science. Uh, if we know how big something is, then we're able to know um, and how fast it goes across the star. We can figure out its orbit, how much mass it has, all these cool fun properties about that uh, planetary body. We saw this one star where the light dipped by an insane amount. Like, and it and like uh, it didn't just like dip and come back. It like dipped and fluctuated and like bounced around all over. Like it doesn't make sense. And so the only thing that like might answer this is a Dyson sphere. And then Dyson sphere is a construction project on a on a on an utterly massive scale where you like surround or partially surround a star uh, with stuff like you know solar panels and, and whatever as a means to like quite literally collect all of the energy coming off that star and so like this this whole little, little thing has sort of baffled the the scientists that are looking at it. they don't know exactly what they're looking at right now they're still working it is it is kind of a a uh, kind of a discovery to see out there in the universe it is it is really really nifty did you have hi yes i found its name um so the first one was a strange panel of light near a distant star that they discovered back in October, which was KIC 8462852. Um, and basically that one dip, it was experiencing dips up to 22% when normally star brightnesses are around 1%. Uh, but there's a second star with strange dips in brightness, which is named EPIC uh, 20427896, which is estimated to be about the size of our sun in diameter, but only half of its mass. So the thing, yeah, so it's, it's very, very strange because it has dips in light and light curves. So you're unmuted. Yeah, it, that's like, some, there, there's some kooky stuff that they've started to find out there and and yeah it's it's really kind of nippy and really cool so uh more stuff like that is going to keep being found as they look for as, as their telescopes so, report well one of the cool things that they mentioned is that uh they came up with two plausible explanations and one not so plausible explanation and so the first one that was that it's a large okay hmm What's up? I don't know. You're cutting in and out? Yep. My phone is... My, my headphone is wailing. Are you doing a battery? No, it's fucking... There we go. There we go. Hi, I'm back. Okay. Anyway, the first, the first plausible, plausible explanation... explanation was that the uh, large and irregular light curves were being caused by a massive swarm of comets that were orbiting the star. Um, but the second explanation uh, is that it could be a distorted star because it spins so fast and it becomes obelated, meaning it has a larger radius at the equator than it does at the poles. Um, and so this would produce higher temperatures, a brightening at the poles while the equator is darkened. Um, and the not so plausible idea is that the dimming is being caused by a kind of Dyson sphere, a gigantic sphere made of solar panels that completely encircles a star, featured in several science fiction stories. 
So aliens are always the last hypothesis you, you should consider, but this looked like something you would expect an alien civilization to build. All right, Danny, you're Danny, unmuted. You're unmuted. Is one of the possible scenarios, but I think it's one of the neatest possible scenarios. So, all right, we had another question come in from Peter. Um, have you run the app Skyview? Um, I don't think so, uh, but hold on, let me, let me, is that a Google product, Mr. Pitt? Uh, I have it's a, a, it's a cool product that you can put on your smartphone. Uh, when you scan, out into space, daytime, nighttime, doesn't matter. It'll it'll show you what's in your field of view. Uh, you can search for planets. You can search for the International Space Station, find out where the International Space Station is, where it's going, where it's been. Um, you could probably put in those planet, those star numbers, if, if you could remember them. And who knows, it might even point you that direction. Oh, that'd be super cool. I'll have to, to look at that one. Um, I've got one on my phone that originally came from, I, I think it, it was made by Google. It's called SkyMap. Um, and so like it's kind of, sort of augmented reality issue. You can sort of hold it up and then sort of look around and it'll point out constellations. It doesn't have all the cool, cool stuff in it. Um, yeah, that's exactly, have, that's exactly what SkyView does. You hold it up and it superimposes what satellites, planets, whatever are in your field of view on the camera. Fantastic. Um, and then I also have one, it's an ISS uh, space station detector. Um, and and yeah, so yesterday I got a ding on it and, and Renee and I and Megan, we all went outside to try to go see, maybe hopefully, fingers crossed, we'd see a break in the clouds and see uh, uh, the ISS transit across, but it, it wasn't gonna happen. Um, but one of the other things, and if you guys, if you guys do have a, like an ISS detector or one of these, um, see if you can um, also get a trigger for, um, um, oh, they're uh, iridium flares. You'll see it on the app. It'll be labeled iridium flares. Um, there, it's not actually iridium, but um, there's a communications constellate, communication satellite constellation up in uh, orbit right now called the iridium constellation. And because uh, iridium ha has the atomic number 77, and the constellation was originally going to have 77 satellites, that's where the name came from. They ended up figuring out that they don't need quite 77 to get covered that they wanted, but they still, the name was too ingrained, and so they still kept the name. Um, and so the cool thing about these satellites is they have these three big uh, flat uh, array, you know, uh, antenna arrays on the bottom Earth-facing side of the satellite, um, and they have a slow spin to them because, you know, for gyroscopic stabilization. And because, because again, or because orbital dynamics is so, like, freaking perfect, and you can calculate everything down to, to the, the nth degree. Um, if you see uh, a trigger for an iridium flare, basically what that means is at that exact moment for standing where exactly where you are on Earth, as the satellite flies overhead, as it's rotating, there will be a moment where uh, you will see, uh, you'll have a perfect reflection off one of those panels from the sun down to where you are. Um, and so you'll see it, like, if you've ever seen the ISS fly over, right, it's this little, you know, very bright star that sort of, whips across from horizon to horizon in about four-ish, five minutes. Um, so this sort of looks like that, but over a much smaller segment of the sky, and they're like, maybe a minute. Um, and so they just go from like total black to, you know, they get brighter and brighter and brighter as they're moving, and then they'll sort of hit their, their peak uh, brightness, and then they just sort of trail off. Um, but they happen rather quickly. Um, and one of the, the interesting things is, they're actually phasing out the iridium, the original iridium design um, for iridium next, um, and so those satellites don't have the same uh, panel array, uh, and so those uh, aren't going to do the cool flare trick. Um, so, like, there is actually a small-ish amount of time left to be to potentially see an iridium flare, and it is one of the niftiest, coolest things. Like, if you like, I geek out about the ISS flying over. It's like that times 10 to see one of these little things because it's, it's people who like know the very exact orbital, you know, attributes of, you know, these satellites calculating down to the very minutest little thing of, of showing exactly where these reflections are going to hit. Um, and they are, they're perfect. I mean, like it's, orbital dynamics is great. Orbital dynamics is every high school physics classroom problem. There's no drag, there's no friction. 
like they're I, as ideal as ideal can get. They're they're just kind of nutty. Um, they're not always circular orbits. Uh, sometimes they're they're elliptical. A lot of times they're elliptical. But like they're they're like high school physics room perfect scenarios. So um, yeah, they're 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 really really cool. Um, sort of little blips that happen out in the the night sky. They're they're awesome. And if you can uh, get an app that'll tell you when you're gonna see one for where you are. Like definitely try to go, you know, stand outside on a nice warm day and and you know see one fly overhead because they're just the coolest things. So, all right, well, cool beans. I think it's it's six o'clock now, so I think maybe if this is the right time to transition over, I gotta check my uh 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 nope. I think I get I, six to six thirty is doing a a thing. Awards and suspended events. Well, okay, I'm just gonna like, I just got this email, like uh, we're gonna go with like 25 minutes ago. Um, so we're just gonna like, it's an email directly from first, which is like really, really cool. It has a, a really big piece of info. So uh, we'll, we'll just do like sort of a, a, a reading to the class uh, here. So partway through this email, they're talking about the awards and the suspended events and whatnot. And so the header says, first Dean's List Award, first bullet point. All students that have been nominated for the Dean's List will receive an interview remotely. First, very good, that is an awesome solution. Um, students will be considered for the event that they are already assigned to. A local judge advisor will reach out to the lead coach slash mentor one and two um, to schedule a time for the interview. Each suspended regional event will have two finalists selected. Uh, that's regional stuff, regional stuff, regional stuff. Um, Danny, I'm sure that we can assume that um, when they talk about regionals for the selection process that uh, the process for the districts will remain the same. Uh, the interviews will happen and uh, they will name the um, nominated finalists from each district event we would have yeah. had and then uh, go on from there. I just needed to jump down one bullet point because the next bullet point talks about districts. It says the number of finalists for district uh, for districts varies by district and each student will be interviewed at least once and considered for one of the district's finalist spots. So the, the process that's happened at normally uh, is now just going to happen virtually as opposed to being live and in person at the event. So, we, we had heard some rumblings that first was gonna try to work really hard to get some stuff like this figured out. So uh, this is just sort of confirmation of that. And this is super awesome that, you know, all the Dean's List, you know, students are gonna get interviewed and they're gonna, you know, all that stuff's gonna happen. And that's like really, really super awesome. Um, and then there's another little blurb here about the Woody Flowers finalist award. And so uh, as the judging process is done remotely, finalists will be chosen for each event just as if the event occurred as scheduled. All mentors who have been nominated for the Woody Flowers Finalist Award will be considered for the event they were nominated for. Finalists and re-nominated uh, WFFAs will then be judged by the Woody Flowers Group uh, and considered for the, uh, inform you on how the finals and winners will be announced. So, uh, just like Dean's List, uh, cool things for the Woody Flowers uh, finalist award and the, the, the Woody Flowers award. Um, so, really cool. Um, good news um, that is coming out of um, this email that was sent out by first about 27 minutes ago. So, that's really cool. Oh, Peter says the audio is breaking up. Have I done a little bit better, Peter? Hopefully, fingers crossed. This is better. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, okay, so uh, so that was our cool, fun Q&A. Um, and if you guys have any other like cool, fun space Q&A stuff, um, if you drop it in the things, and I will um, either take some time at the end to sort of rifle through those quickly or um, I can reply to people over email or, or whatnot like that. Um, but now um, the, the, the next kind of half an hour or so bit, I think till about 6.30, um, is sort of a little bit more like a TED talk. Um, 
So a little bit more like um, sort of a, a forms presentation or, or something sort of like that. So um, one of the things that I've talked about at forums before is sort of the, you know, some best practices and sort of some, some resource constrained uh, design um, and sort of how, you know, the, the various sort of team attributes and, and things can kind of impact how you might go about designing a robot. Um, and so we'll kind of, you know, we kind of chat some of there. Um, Again, if you guys have questions, uh, drop them in the in the chat group, um, and I'll just sort of add those in. Um, if I don't see, if I don't look like I've seen or your question, and I don't, you know, kind of address it, you know, right away, um, maybe try putting it again in all caps, and that'll help me kind of pick it up. Um, I'll keep. So, I'll, I'll help you out, Danny, and watch the chat as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Um, so. Resource constrained design applies to the robot, and that's sort of the the main thing that sort of people always sort of look at it around. Um, but it also applies to basically anything. Um, so, you know, late in the build season, you know, we were kind of going through the exact same process um, that we did early on for the robot. We were doing it uh, to design sort of the scouting system for the robot. Um, you know, but we've also talked about it in terms of the team website, you know, how much, you know, what kind of resources can we bring to bear in, on the, the team website, you know, so that we can have sort of a cool, um, you know, a cool product and also, you know, something that is useful for people. So um, there are there are much cooler websites uh, in the world, um, but, you know, a lot of those really, really cool websites have phenomenally large teams of people, you know, managing them. Um, and so, you know, we don't have that level of resource, but, you know, what was, you know, what were some of the cool things that we could do with, you know, the, the people, time and talent resources, you know, physical resources, um, you know, various elements, you know, that we had. So, you know, a lot of different, you know, things kind of, you know, at play there. And, and one of the places where things sort of start, you know, kind of first and foremost is really sort of looking at, you know, what, you know, really kind of taking an honest look at what resources you really do, you know, have and, and what you can bring to bear on the problem. Uh, and so, you know, if, if that is, you know, we've, we've got, you know, a, a subject matter expert, you know, for this, either that be, you know, a mentor who comes to our meetings, you know, every time that we have a meeting, or if it's somebody, you know, sort of tangentially related to, you know, our community, you know, parent or, you know, or, or somebody else, you know, uh, another teacher at the school, you know, that we can, you know, loop in for, you know, a meeting here and there. Um, one of the things, you know, that we've been very lucky with on Shamrock Robotics is we have a parent on the, you know, one of the students on the team who, um, I don't know if she is a graphic designer or, or, you know, kind of does graphic design things as a hobby, um, but either way, she has a very significant skill set around it. Um, and so our kids on the team have gone through and like drawn up what we want our sort of fun t-shirt, fun logo to be for the year. Um, and then, you know, kind of on a one or two, you know, day, you know, sort of basis, you know, they, you know, they take that, that final sketch, that final design and, you know, give it to the parent. Parent comes into the team meeting, works with the kids on sort of digitizing it and making it sort of a final thing. And then, you know, we can send it off to the t-shirt vendor and, and get that made as sort of our fun shirt for the year. Um, this year we had a, a uh, like an extension or a, a power strip, you know, sort of where the cord looped around horn to shamrock and plugged back into itself um, because the meme of infinite recharge uh, before the season started was, was extension cords plugged into themselves. And that's hilarious. Um, and so, you know, so that was a different level of resource, you know, that, you know, but still something that we could access. So something that we could go after. So really trying to take a really strong and solid look at what resources you can sort of really truly bring to bear on the problem. Um, and uh, one of the, the things that at first feels really sobering, um, but is, is a really healthy thing to kind of go look at is sort of the understanding that just because, you know, there are certain, you know, teams or organizations out there that have a lot more resources than your team or your organization, you know, does not mean that, you know, they are just automatically, you know, in a better spot. If, if they have more resources, but use them poorly, then you might be in a far better spot than they are. So, 
you know, it also kind of comes into, you know, the idea of just because, you know, this is the way that, you know, like, I'll, I'll go back to scouting. So teams typically talk about scouting as like the right way to do it is with six people, one watching each robot and, you know, and then kind of collecting data and maybe a seventh person aggregating it all together. Um, you know, maybe an eighth and ninth person sort of analyzing it, looking at it and helping to pass that along to, to drive teams so that they can go out and, and execute a really good strategy for the next match. Well, it takes a lot of people. Not every team has a lot of people to devote to scouting. Um, and so, you know, if you only have two or three people, then the, the best thing that you can do is design a system that only requires two or three people. Um, and, and sort of asking the question, how much data can we reliably take in with two or three people? Um, and you can still do some fairly significant, fairly astonishing things um, if that's how you set your system up. If you try to set your system up for six people and then only put three people at it, you know, you're going to lose about half the information that you set up to go collect. So, you know, there, there is no singular one right answer. And, and you know, that, that is a tough nut for a lot of you know high schoolers i think to to kind of wrap their brains around because so much of the time they you know earlier in the day they were sitting in math class or they were sitting in in physics class and in a high school math room like there is a single right answer like two plus two is always four that's just the way it is if you put down five you're wrong like, that's just the way it is but you get into the robotics team room and you get into the, you know, kind of the first world, there is no one singular right answer. It, you know, the, the, a lot of times the best answer is how can we bring the resources that we have to bear in the most effective way? Um, and that's definitely something that, you know, I've had to go through with, you know, a lot of the kids on, on Chime Robotics and Cyber Cards, you know, before that, you know, and, and just trying to help people sort of wrap their brains around like, there is no one right answer. There's a lot of different ways that we can go about doing this um, and still be really successful. Um, and so, you know, that's a, that's a really big part. And it, one of the hardest things that we've ever, you know, we, we sort of routinely have to do year over year is try to, you know, have sort of that open and honest conversation with the kids around the best teams in the world will set their bar up here. And they have a level of resource that allow them to do that. And, you know, we don't have that many kids, that many mentors, that much, you know, experience, that many, you know, that kind of a machine shop or, or whatever the situation might be. Um, but we've got this stuff that we can see here. We've got, um, you know, a, a talented group of, you know, mentors. We've got a, a wonderfully excited, you know, group of kids. Um, you know, we are, as much as we try to be, you know, really passionate, clever problem solvers. So like two years ago when we had a bunch of snow, uh, we had Zoom meetings because we couldn't meet in person, uh, but we could meet digitally. Uh, so we had Zoom meetings, um, kind of like this. This is fun. Um, and so, so we do we do that kind of stuff to to bring those resources to bear. Um, and and it took us a little bit of time to really sort of get the point across that we were not calling the kids bad, or we were not calling our uh, our robotics team bad or lesser we were just calling us different you know we were we had a and, and so like last year for the you know with, with shamrock robotics we really sort of leaned into the idea that we build out of a wood shop these are the level of resources that we have um you know, we've got a lot of tooling you know we've got you know, chops on miter saw table saw and drill press we, we've got a lot of stuff to build out of wood so let's go do that and let's, let's lean into that in a big, bad way. Um, and people thought it was really cool. They're like, oh, man, that's a wood robot. That's really neat. Um, and then those same people were, like, really surprised when we came back to the game this year with a wood robot. And, like, they're like, oh, you guys are still doing that? It's like, oh, we still build out of the same wood shops. So, yeah, we're totally still doing that. Um, and and the, the kids have really sort of leaned into this idea. Like, this is how we go build a good robot. Um, and, and so that's kind of, you know, some of the, the best kind of lessons learned, you know, that, that we can, um, you know, that, that we've sort of garnered, you know, through, through some of the, these processes is really trying to figure out how we, you know, bring those resources to bear. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, it, oh boy, for the, I mean, this process is obviously not 
bulletproof. Um, the process, you know, still, you know, you can still do it wrong. Uh, our ball pickup mechanism at Bloomington was, you know, uh, at best. Um, but, you know, it, it, building the robot the way that we did was the best way to build a robot for our team and our organization. Um, so that's sort of uh, the, the, the long end of my, my soapboxy rant. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Anything you'd like me to go on further? Feedback for me if I do this again, things I don't need to spend as much time on. Well, as we collect that information, um, I've now muted you, Danny. Um, so if for those who have been on the line and haven't necessarily been taking a look at your emails, uh, we did just get an update from um, first, basically explaining, um, yep. Oh, very exciting. Thank you for doing that. I got you, homie. Cool beans. So, if you have nothing to say for 10 more minutes, then we could always invite Andy in to um, speak a little bit earlier. Yep. Now you're on. We could collectively as a group flip through the uh, memes on the FRC subreddit. They have some good memes. Uh, no, I think we're good. <clears throat> Much appreciated. So Andy, it currently says that you are unmuted. Can you try saying hello? We have this very, very fun picture of you. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. There's two Andys. Oh, okay. Andy, both of them are unmuted. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Hi, we can hear you now. And I lost my screen. Hang on a second. There you are. I can also mute it if that makes sense. Uh, you're, you're good. I'm, I'm good here. I think I was I was on a phone I was on a phone um, connection when I first called in, and then I got home and I decided to drop that because I obviously you want to be on the chat with this exciting program, so that it, you got to be on the chat. Yeah. So. I'm not on my phone, it's down, and it's hung up. So I'm, I'm wondering why there's two of me here, but that's okay, it, you, you, it's, it's all good. But um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's, it's been, a, it's been um, quite an odd week, I mean, quite a unique week for all of us. Um, things have been, it's been a roller coaster ride for me and crew at, at Andy Mark, that's for sure. It's just been crazy. Yeah. But um, I'm just, uh, go ahead. No, well, so um, I figured this was a great time. You know, we're working on this virtual community. We're kind of identifying these different options to put together. Um, and, uh, you know, as someone who, you know, this is kind of unprecedented in terms of uh, challenges to work through, I just kind of would love to uh, hear from you about some of your thoughts, um, you know, how the proposal for the um, Woody Flowers Award plan went, and then also um, just kind of maybe um, talk a little bit about some of the unique problem solving aspects that you've kind of seen people work through uh, that you maybe have been impressed with as it relates to um, our community and what's been going on. Good, thank you. Um, gosh, okay, so. I've actually had a lot of meetings with our staff this week. Um, we, 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 I don't, personally, I don't mind getting things thrown at me and having, having um, change happen to my life. And I, I find it kind of thrilling, but I realize also that's not the case for many, many people out there, including my wife, who, who we work pretty well together, but she doesn't like she doesn't like change. And I think she's very normal in that fact. I'm probably the abnormal one. I, I don't mind the change and the, the thrill and the challenge. But after a, after a whole you know craziness of that for now two weeks of just ups and downs in the first community and everybody's lives, I think it's how we all handle change and how we all handle adversity and uh, how we deal with that. I think it's it's probably gonna it's pretty 
pretty taxing on our mental state. I mean, so I've been talking to our staff and I, I, I'm pretty honest. I say, hey, you guys, you guys know what's going on as much as I do. I just have to make some decisions about, about um, you know, who's going to do what, who's going to, are we going to take and work home? Um, uh, are, who's, who's working now at Andy Mark while they're, the county is on a, um, a code orange type of situation? Um, we have people who work from home, like, like Danny, he, he works at Andy Mark, so he's working from home and that's great. Um, but there's also people that can't work from home. So we, we actually, like today, we, we, I saw like 20 different big boxes of stuff go out the door for people to assemble and kit things all of next week. And so I, I, they want a job. I want to keep them employed. But if they can't, if they're not supposed to come to work, how do I do that? So we're trying to figure out ways to, to be flexible and, and adapt with this uncertainty of change and all this thing. So I think, I think um, being able to adapt and being able to deal with change is something that we're all being tested with. And not, not just in first, but you know, the kids and teachers and school, school administrators, companies, um, local um, political leaders who are now really being challenged to lead and make decisions and such. So how, I guess, how we can deal with change and how we can adapt to change um, if we can handle it well, I think we're maybe ahead of other people who, who can't and, and who, who freak out or get very anxious about those things. And I think that's nothing wrong with that. But I think being able to handle this these, this adversity and these changes, I think, are things that um, are going to set us aside for being successful during this this tough time. Um, that's, I'm just speaking pretty much in general. Um, there, there's a few things that happened at, at work this week. And there's a few things that are happening in the first community that I'm involved with that um, I can talk more about. Uh, one of the things, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is um, what would Woody do, right? So what, what would Woody do? What would Woody come out and talk about? And I did see, as we were talking here, I did see on social media that um, I'm, I'm interested to see what he says, but there's a, there's a video message out to the first community from Dean Cameron. So I, after this, after this is over, I'm going to go out and see what Dean says to the first community about about the coronavirus and this pandemic and all that. Well, what does he say about it? I'm kind of interested to see his probably mostly a scientific ask, attitude about how to deal with this thing. Um, but I'm also curious about what what Woody would say. And now that Woody's passed, it's, it's you know we, we got to think about um, you know we can imagine what he would say. But as a as a Woody Flowers Award winner and on the committee for Woody Flowers Award judging, um, I can follow up with what what Danny uh, told us regarding um, the Woody Flowers Awards. And Excellent. What, what what we've done um, as a committee, we've, we've talked about this uh, a little bit, and I can't really say uh, what our total plan is because we don't know yet exactly. So bear with me here. I know we're talking about some things. But it was announced that our plan is to is, is make progress through the weeks and announce the regional winners and then also announce the district championship Woody Flowers finalist award winners. Um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how, that, how that's being announced, but um, we're still judging. So, so we, get, we get randomly placed into, into judging positions, and um, that's super confidential which events we judge. But... Um, we're still judging and we're not done. And um, so I don't, they're not all decided yet, but we stopped on week, we, we stopped announcing on week two a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so eventually, pretty soon, I'm not sure how yet, but eventually week three and then week four, five, and six will be announced. And then I think during week six, there's a few district championships like Indiana and others. So week six will have um, some regionals and some district championships, and then week seven will have some regionals and mostly district championships. And then eventually we'll get to the point where we have a, a Woody Flowers Award announced, and that, that is probably the most uncertain how we're going to do that. We're talking about all kinds of options on how to do that, and um, I think um, one of the things that came up during our discussion, and this is kind of uh, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll say it. But one of the things that came up during our discussion was we would rather announce the awards 
sooner rather than later, um, especially the Woody Flowers finalist awards, even though the teams might not be together. Um, it, it would be optimal if, the, if we can announce them pretty soon and the teams are together to enjoy and celebrate, right? But we also don't want to put this, these things off for a few months. We don't know how, we don't know how impactful this darn thing's going to be. We don't know how impactful the, the pandemic is going to be. We don't know how much it's going to spread. We don't, who, we don't know who's going to get sick. I don't, I don't, we, want to, we want to be able to celebrate these people as they're not sick, right? So um, we rather, we'd, I think we'd rather announce them sooner than later, even though later means they're with their teams. Now with regard to the championship award, um, that's, that's a little bit different story. And that's not going to happen. Um, that's going to happen, obviously, after the week seven um, district and regional finalists are awarded. And but I don't know how how soon after that will be awarded. Does that make sense to you guys? Renee, does that make sense to you, Renee? Yep. Yep. I think yeah. So thanks for explaining. Uh, you know, I think some of the reasoning behind it. Uh, I, you know, I think it's really great that the teams have some answers. So I think that that's kind of a positive in light of everything that's going on. Um, you know, I definitely appreciate, I think that the mental health piece is really important. Like one of the things we did earlier um, is we talked about having everyone share something they're grateful for. Oh, um, yeah, I that. And we got a lot of good answers. Um, and for those who weren't there, you know, you're welcome to share as well. But the reason, um, you know, again, we think about what we're grateful for and we really kind of focus on those things is because that's one of the techniques that, you know, reminds you that there's, there's these good things in the world. And, um, you know, this is a trying time. Uh, we're social distancing. Uh, this is why we're kind of creating this opportunity for our community to come together is because we'd rather be here together. Um, instead of a part, uh, you know, doing this by ourselves. And so I, you know, I've said it before and I say it again, um, every time I go through a challenge with my, you know, this, this Finn family, um, I would rather, you know, the, I would rather go through challenges here um, than, you know, have to deal with other problems in other areas elsewhere, so. Yeah. I, I do I do have a couple of things that have popped up this week that are pretty exciting. Um, yeah. And and I tell you, when, when one of these things rolls into work and they're asking, we're getting asked to help on something or we have an opportunity, my gosh, it's really thrilling to, to jump in and, and help. Um, yeah. I'll give you a, I'll give you one example. There's this there was a company actually it was about it was mid February. And there was a company out east that won an award. I'm not gonna give you detailed names, I don't I don't think I should, I guess. But there was a company out east that won an award, and they were they, they were they were given a, an award, and uh, they also got a patent for a a low cost ventilator. So a ventilator for for a person to be able to handle other people who might be sick. And so when the pandemic broke out in China, they went they went to the World Health Organization and they and they they pitched their their device, and the World Health Organization said, yeah, this is great. Um, we're going to get you some help, and there might be some demand for this. And now, granted, this is patented, and they uh, so one of the things they're using in this device is a PG motor. So one of the little PG motors off of off from Andy Mark, I guess one of the one of the guys on the team must have been a firster, and he just had this motor sitting around when they originally came up with the design. And it's it's a PG motor. It's just the one with the encoder on it. Doesn't use a gearbox. So he said, they've been buying these motors for a while. So he said, I, well, I need a quote for 100. I need a quote for 1,000. I need a quote for 10,000 of these motors. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And we we're thinking, is this guy legit? Is he for real? And we all looked it up. And, yeah, this, this company won this big award, and they have a patent, and it's great. That's so, amazing. Did um, that happen today? It, that happened a couple weeks ago. Okay. And then it kind of died down. We, he, he got I – think, I think they kind of recoiled, and they were planning their manufacturing – and he just sure. called today, and he, he said, okay, this has gotten hotter again. I, I need that quote. I gave him a quote for 1000 back then, but he said, I need a, another quote for 1000 a quote for 10000 I want to buy 100 So we sent out 100 to him today. He's going to get them next week. And he, he said there's, like, there's all kinds of other groups working on this same thing. Now, theirs is patented, and I think, they've, I think he hinted that they've, they've shared their patent with others because that's what a patent is. That's great. You have a you have a protected design, but you 
you publicize your design. And I think they, they, they started to share their patent with other people. Um, he said that, this guy said that one um, very large um, American automotive company called him and said, hey, we can help you build this thing. Yes. So these are just young recent graduates from, from MIT and Harvard. And then there's another group who uh, is associated with some of these colleges that they're making something kind of like it. And then there's another guy out in the Bay Area who, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, um, Guy Calvacanti, who was one of the two guys that ran Megabots. He oh. now is, is out in San Francisco and he's running an open source design and build of ventilators and it's happening right now and he's if you follow him on facebook it's pretty entertaining and uh, he's being interviewed by everybody in the press national nationwide because he's he's coordinating this open source ventilator project there's all kinds of talk about 3d printing um respiratory systems and, and masks and such and there's like uh, there's some uh, 3D filament that you're not supposed to use. You got to watch which ones you use. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. But there's there's a whole bunch going on in the in the maker and engineering world to to help um, get a solution for you know dealing with the disease, helping people who can provide care, um, disinfecting. But for instance, just just today, we um, one of our engineers said, hey, we, we should we should get one of these foggers and put it on our Transcend tactical robot and, and try to sell that to Homeland Security to, put, to help fog systems. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take this idea one step further. Now this is, a, this is what, it's called a ULV fogger, mm -hmm. ultra low volume fogger. And right. that's what, I, and I've seen some videos in China how they, guys are walking around and they're, and they're fogging this thing, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Everybody I see fogging, they're on the, they're in these like hazmat suits and such. I don't know how harmful the fogging stuff is, but what if, what if all these first teams that we know of, what if we got foggers and we put them on our robots and we use our limelights and our pixie cams and whatever and we drove once once things do settle down a little bit and there is a there is a demand for fogging, we have robots, we have camera, we have robots with cameras, we can. Yeah probably put foggers on robots with cameras and we can drive them into schools, drive them into hospital. Once people get out of there and, and what happens with these foggers is that it like the fog settles on surfaces and it, it um, kills the virus on these surfaces. It doesn't keep it from being transmitted from person to person, but it disinfects the room in, in a, in a, in a way that it helps. I mean, it's not going to, yeah. Cure it hundred percent, but maybe that's something we should look in as a community. I'll look into it um, starting next week. I'm going to I'm going to call Homeland Security here in Indiana and see if they have any need for this kind of thing. But I'm sure the foggers are kind of hard, hard to get these days. But one thing we have, and they're sitting doing nothing, is a bunch of robots that can run auto modes, or better yet, can run teleop with camera feedback. Um, probably the biggest problem might be distance like how long can you drive a robot into a school or into a into right. a um, hospital those kind. but my, my point is there's there's these cool things happening there's um things that as we as technical people who want to solve problems i encourage everybody to to look for those things because you can find stuff like this that maybe you can help out maybe your idea your brainstorming idea just like just like it is on the robotics team can help out um, make your community better in some way Absolutely. by using your robot, using your brain. Well, and I think what's really cool. So, um, you know, I, I had a couple examples that literally just came across Facebook today. Um, but Kelsey, my friend Kelsey is a, um, she's a materials engineer and her mom, um, is basically, you know, out on the front lines in terms of the medical, um, healthcare pieces that are going on. And so, uh, she's heard updates that like people are starting to run out of, of, uh, personal and protective equipment. And so one of the things she did is she, um, at her work, she looked at an SEM machine, um, which basically allows you to take like those, you know, really close up views of the materials that you're utilizing. And, this scanning electron microscope and um she looked at the different like sizes and widths and you can kind of like see the pictures here 
associated with these, uh, an old medical mask that she found, which is this picture, versus uh, some of the quilting cotton that she had as well. And so it was kind of exciting to see that like there are people out there who then were able to um, share like information from the CDC about how you can optimize the supply of um, face masks and then also what was really cool uh, was that this group in Evansville actually provided um, hmm? actually provided this option in terms of um, fabric, washable fabric masks. And so they created this uh, face mask, you know, PDF, uh, where you can literally take fabric, um, as long as you get like the cotton print and the information, and you can make this uh, face mask um, for people. And so actually what's kind of cool to see, uh, Andy, I know that, you, you know, Evansville, uh, Indiana is near and dear uh, to your heart because that's where we went to uh, college. But uh, one of the cool things is that, you know, this organization, um, which is based in Evansville, Indiana, they have been overwhelmed by their support. They have plenty of masks coming their way. And so they're saying maybe reach out to a hospital, nursing home, um, or other organizations that uh, may need more masks. So I thought that was really inspiring too. Um, and that just came from, you know, that was shared on Facebook and it got on my Facebook feed because one of our first alumni is doing this type of research. Um, and that was just really cool. cool. Speaking of face masks, I, face masks, I do want to say something. We have, I mean, this day and age right now, China's kind of getting beat up and um, we, we have a few Chinese suppliers that supplies um, motors and bearings and chain and that kind of stuff. And um, every single one of those suppliers we have relationships with, they are contacting us and they're saying, "Hey, do you guys want face masks? Because you, we don't think we don't think the U.S. is taking this as seriously as they should, and we think you need face masks. Uh, face masks. So we, we are sending you the right face mask. So like early this That's coming funny. week, there's going to be face masks coming into Andy Mark. And so I told our staff today, and I said most of these, the majority of these, will go to local hospitals and such. But if you have someone who's at risk, you know, like like my wife's father is in the nursing home mm -hmm. and he's at risk, obviously. So I need, right. we need to get some face masks to him and his staff to treat people there. But really hospitals need that kind of stuff um, the most. Um, so yeah, I mean, these, we've had, we have, we have great partnerships and suppliers in China that care about us. So they care about, um, you know, not just, getting the next order, but how we're doing. And uh, in this day and age of, of China getting beat up for these things, I want to say that I've got some really good, really good friends and people that care about us and our customers from China. That's amazing. That, um, I don't know. I, I think that that's super exciting um, that everyone cares so much. Uh, so you're, you're, you know, in the in the face of these really big challenges, it's really great to see these different pieces. And also, I wanted to give a shout out because Wendy Austin tuned in from Florida. So, hi, Wendy. Thanks for joining us here. Well, hi, Wendy. That's pretty cool. It is. Oh, you're still muted, Wendy. Should we unmute you? We can unmute you. Yeah. You're at, you yes. are. Uh, there you go. Nope. Here. Okay. Um, you guys always have the best ideas, and, you know, I got nothing else to do. <laughs> Well, thank you. I mean, you know, did you see us reading the small children at our events? That was our most recent morning. I have seen that. I have seen that. Uh, I appreciate that one. Um, well, oh, Wendy, can you give us an introduction? I, I mean, from my point of view, you're legendary because of, uh, yes, just, me, oh, me here, too. here, ready? Oink, oink. Boom. Yes. Okay. All right. Go with your introduction. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm Wendy Austin. I'm the regional director in Orlando. I've been around forever. Wendy is, Wendy is, uh, in my opinion, she's kind of like a surrogate mom to probably a thousand different firsters aged probably 35 to 17 or 18. And they, she's an adored um, figure within first. If, if you go to any regional or world championships and such, you'll see Wendy. She always has a smile on her face. She's always ready for a big old hug, and she's really supportive to um, a lot of – I mean, she's, 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 
she's kind of like my age, but she acts like she's 25 or 30, which I really oh, admire. I'm a little, a little older than you, Andy, but okay. No worries. That's <laughs> um, you guys, man, if you're going to talk like this, I'm going to join you every Friday at happy hour. You should. Uh, we, you know, we're going to Thursdays and Fridays, four to seven. Um, feel free to join in. Um, we can fit up to 500 people and we are looking for presenters and topics. Honestly, that's if you a, don't. That's yep. A, that's a brilliant idea. We should probably try that in Florida. Yes, absolutely. Um, Chris Osborne can send you some information about Zoom and cost effective ways to leverage it. I am learning how to Zoom. We did a Zoom happy hour with our children last night. Oh, very exciting. Turned, turned into a drinking game. It was very interesting. Uh, <laughs> all right. My actual children. My yes. actual children. Yes, yes. Uh, that are, yes, that are definitely They're all, all well them. over 21. Yes. Um, I'm enjoying so other it. exciting I, news. We are recording. Other I'm exciting news. A, a diet Werner's ginger ale. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. All right. Uh, so we, one of the cool organizations that I follow is called Reinvented uh, Magazine. And so uh, I guess I should go to Reinvented. There we go. I mean, it's, you know, instant pop up. Uh, but so basically, they're an organization um, that was created because uh, one of the contacts was frustrated um, at the fact that you couldn't really find magazines that were geared towards uh, women in STEM. And after getting, you know, uh, teen fashion magazines and not really having access to something that was related to how women in STEM are kind of, you know, leading these charges, um, she started creating, you know, this, this magazine. And the whole idea is that um, the the notion of STEM being predominantly masculine fields is something that really we need to work on changing and adapting, but there's only one way to truly change something and that's to reinvent it. And so that's how the name reinvented came along. Um, and so it's reinvented magazine. The group of young women who are running this are just fabulously and fantastically talented. Um, I've been um, on the phone with them, helping them coordinate their Lego minifigure building event, which just, which took place the same weekend as our Bloomington event. Um, we even, you know, I think even Wendy maybe knew about it because I called in some help down in Florida where it was being hosted. But then um, the, in terms of uh, reinvented magazine because there are so many students that have been sent home and they have to finish out their school semester virtually uh, there's another free resource available and so the reinvented magazine um, issue one they're getting giving out free copies um, to everyone who who wants it so you are welcome to fill out the link um, that's attached here and take a look at um, you know, this amazing article, uh, which I, ooh, I have right here, um, which is really great, doo, doo, doo. but it focuses on, uh, here we go, uh, the former uh, US CTO, Megan Smith, um, and uh, a few other like pretty fantastic things. And so you can get this digital copy. I have a physical copy because I invest in this organization because I believe in what they're doing. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that y'all knew about this opportunity because it's really cool. So does anyone have any questions uh, for Andy? Because we have about 13 minutes left uh, and want to make sure that we have time for, to ask any questions. My, my answer is 22. That's different from 42. I would, I would answer, when I was at Delphi, I would, someone would come up to me, they would, they would say, well, Andy, I have a question. I would say 22. And they say, well, I haven't answered the question yet. And that I was, you know, for about 10 years, I would do that. The one guy, one day, actually did come up to me and said, I have a question, 22. So he says, hmm, that sounds about right. Are you sure? It's like, I don't know what you're asking. He said, well, what's the length of whatever part that we made for this machine? And I was, and I was like, and I was right. After like 10 years of asking an internet question, that's a really bad story, but I thought that was funny. To me, my humor is very weird. It is all right. You, you could, you could tell, tell us. Uh, here. I mean, since we have you on the line, um, 
So once upon a time, there used to be this uh, really fantastic band called Dean Simmons uh, and the Cayman Brothers. And so oh, I don't know my. if you're a fan um, or if you've ever heard guys. of them. You do? Okay. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask, um, what is your favorite song that they've ever done? And also, maybe you should explain them for some of the younger students who are on this call that people don't know who they are. I was such a big fan. I literally made a like puffy paint fan t-shirt yep, that glows yep. in the dark. I remember that. I uh -huh. I was yeah, always, no. for, for whatever reason, I was always out of town or out of the room when they would perform. Mm -hmm. So they would go up on stage and I would hear about this, but I, I never saw them personally. But they started um, back at the IRI talent show in 2004, mm -hmm. and it was, it was quite a, a good show. But what they are is there, I think there were four or five different people who are cousins of, of Dean Kamen. So there's there's Lars Kamen, who's the drummer. There's Eddie Van Kamen, who's a guitarist. There's Ozzy Kamen, who is the singer. There's um, um, back, Backslash Kamen was around for a little while. He was one of the guitarists. He would wear a top hat like, like Slash, the guitarist. And then there's Ingve Kamen, who um, was quite odd. And then there was a guy named Dean Dean Simmons, I don't know if he, he tried to be like Gene Simmons or something. Anyway, these these guys would play these rock and roll songs, and they would um, they would play cover songs that were rock songs, and they would change the lyrics into something to do with first or something to do with with um, technology. So like, or sometimes it was a country song. I remember one one time they did. Um, what save a save a horse ride a cowboy by was that is that Brooks and Dunn is that right? But big and rich, yeah, Brooks and Dunn, big big and rich. I think they're the same guys. Anyway, I think we think there was some uh, Taylor Swift as well. There was Taylor Later Swift. Years. Yep, there was Taylor Swift. Yeah, and there were and, guests that would come on. So uh, Katie Flowers, mm -hmm. Demanda yes. was it? Demanda came in. D Demanda came in. There yep. was there was. Um, very nice. What was um, was it Libby Simmons? Libby Simmons, yes. Mm -hmm. Who was mm -hmm. who was introduced as Libby Cayman? I remember. I wasn't there. Oh, so it's I didn't embarrassing. Think. Yeah. Yeah, that was. That no. was well, I I, was, I vividly remember that was a very awkward moment. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. But anyway, it, these um, these people knew a lot about first, and I think they knew. They, they were really closely related to a lot of mentors on first teams. And they would always, they would always play at IRI at the Friday night of IRI. And it's been probably three or four years since that happened. And it I really don't... has been too long. Now, admittedly, the mentor matches at IRI are pretty impressive and, and far, far more, not as hilarious, but you know, it's a good time. So I think, I think, I think, I think... there could be like some way to bring, bring the band back together. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, Jane, I did hear that same thing. The, the team social was in Milwaukee. At the, the zoo. Band, the band played in a monkey house at Milwaukee. Yes. I think um, Danny, we were there. Might been, Danny might be. You, you were both we there? We were both there. Uh, right. Danny has a t-shirt from it. That's pretty There's cool. a security. Uh, his older brother was security for them. I just saw a security t-shirt from Dean Kamen last weekend. Greg Needell was wearing one at the Plano District event was it I last weekend. Know. That's funny. But yeah, he just decided to wear it when I was down there. That's good. How was your? So you did go to one event or, or to, two events? I went to three events. I was all over the place for a little while. So I went to what LA did North. you? Yeah, tell us went, about that. L, week one, I went to LA North. Um, Mary uh, has a very good friend who lives in uh, near Burbank, um, Highland Park. We had a good time there. And we went to LA North Regional, which was at the Mamba Sports Center, which, yeah, that was where, that's Kobe Bryant's sports center. So that's, this place was where people played basketball and volleyball and lifted weights, and they were still doing that while this regional was happening. And it was pretty crazy. It was kind of tight pits. Um, they had to bring in bleachers. But they had some really, fan, really um, impressive teams were there. 359 came in from Hawaii, um, 16, um, 1678 Citrus Circuits were there, 
11, uh, 114 and 115 were there. Um, the Rembrandts from Denmark mm -hmm. flew in. They were there with their pink, sh with their orange shirts and such. Um, there were some other teams. 2102 was impressive. Uh, uh, the guy that's Andrew, who's the owner of Armabot, was there, and his team was impressive. I think that's a spinoff from the old 1717, the Penguineers. There are lots of teams that were there. It was very impressive. Um, if, if you are the, a fan of, like, Food Network shows, Duff from Ace of Cakes showed up with a cake. That was kind of <laughs> cool. He and, he and Jeff, uh, Jeff, one of his, one of his um, workmates, and they had a cake for everybody. So that was pretty cool. I got a picture, got a selfie with Duff. He's, I've watched, I've liked Duff since Ace of Cake started. Anyway, it was a good, it was a good event. I saw a lot of good people there. Liz Smith was the, the FTA that was training a new FTA out there who was Ruth. Her name is Ruth. Um, the cool thing about that is Liz, Liz kind of proudly was able to say, I was able to be somebody's Paul George. And so that was pretty oh. cool that Liz was able to do that and mentor somebody because Paul George, rest in peace, mentored Liz. Um, so that was a good event. We, we went to the, race, the Reagan Library. I would recommend doing that for anybody, regardless of your politics, go to the Reagan Library. It's pretty cool. Week two, I went to Salt Lake City and I stayed with my cousin. Um, Salt Lake City has a nice big event at a hockey arena. Um, and there were about 57 teams were there. Outstanding teams all over the place. Um, the second day I was there, I re one person said, hey, you, you want to go see the refugee team? I'm like, what? I've been here all day yesterday. I didn't know there's a, ref there a refugee team. But there is. So all these – I didn't even notice. I went up to them and said, gosh, I, did, I didn't even – I walked by you guys all day long yesterday. I didn't even – I couldn't even tell. You were the refugee team, so good for you for just blending in and being just another team here. That's kind of what they wanted to do. But that was a good event. Um, probably the, the class of that event with regard to robots, I think they ended up winning, was 14-10, Kraken. They, it's a green team out of Den Denver, ran by Don Lutz, and she does a very good job. Um, I saw um, Joe Noble's team, 1339. I saw... Um, uh, uh, gosh, what? Oh, the, uh, Gary Duquette's team out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. They won Chairman's Award. Nice. I forget the name of their team, but it was really cool to see a lot of people there. Um, and then I didn't stay for the finals. I, I flew down to, to Plano, Texas, and I was able to go to a Plano, the Plano district, meet up with some good friends. I saw uh, I saw John B. Noon and Greg Nedell and um, Alan Gregory. Um, didn't you get to walk around on like moon shoes? Yes, yes. Got um, it. I, they asked me if I wanted to MC a few matches. I said, heck yes. So um, Christina Needell went out and bought, actually, see, Amazon primed some of these bouncy moon shoes for the FTAA, who, who, I don't like short jokes, but it was kind of like they were trying to get this FTAA to be taller so she could see over something on the field. It was funny. She was okay with it. So when they said, hey, you want to be, you want to be um, MC. So I, we did that, and I was MC, and it was fun. And I, I introduced well, one match. I introduced 118 and 148 as rookie teams. So that was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, that. And how how long have those two teams been around? Because I mean they've been, been around. One forty eight. One forty eight is a, is an original original what seven? There's only seven teams I think left in the in first that are the, the original twenty eight teams that first year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, obviously, Technocats here in Indiana are one of those teams. But I think one forty eight is also one of those teams. One eighteen. Gosh, one eighteen. Um, I don't know when their first year was. Someone might want to look up that on, on Blue Alliance, but NASA teams didn't start. NASA teams didn't start till like 90, 97 or ninety eight. Hmm. Um, NASA didn't get in. Well, no. Hang on a second. I think Lavery's team one sixteen might have been the first NASA team. I think his team was ninety four or ninety five, and then they got they got um, Houston and they got. Cocoa Beach 
So that's I mean, 118 and 233, they got involved. Got it. And mm-hmm. then 120, I think a Cleveland team is, was a NASA team. And then 254 was – and these are like the NASA home teams or the, or the, um, the house teams. Oh, good. We have people looking it up. So 118 was uh, 1997. So, yeah. yeah. Good I, job. I think, I, think, I think Lavery's team, 116, is the first NASA team, and it kind of went out from there. And I, do, you think, I, do you think we could have Dave Lavery come on to talk about space? He can talk about – you can get – you can – I will I – will, do you feel comfortable inviting him? Yeah. Uh, no. Can you invite him for me? I can. I can. I can invite him. So let me know when you want him. And I think. Okay. So one of the things. Um, I think you guys should have him talk about space because he has some wonderful stories about rovers and that kind of stuff. But also, there are some pretty interesting other things that he could talk about, like his his yearly bike ride to raise money for cancer. He could talk about his. Um, he's a aficionado for donuts and key lime pie. And did bacon. did did he did he get into an arm wrestling match with someone once, or is that someone yes. different? No, that was Woody. He got a, a donut oh, okay. eating match. Donut eating match with Amanda Morrison. Yep. And okay, Amanda, that's what I thought. Amanda was talking big and said, yeah, "I can eat donuts with, with Dave." And Dave has this uncanny ability to eat donuts like one donut in one bite. I don't know if he has a oh. double jointed jaw, but he has some special skills, I'm sure. But there's a, there's a lot of things you guys can talk to Dave about. He's a he's a good guy. Um, he's actually, yes. I think, I think, I think Lucy and I might be staying with him during the um, advocacy conference coming up. So he might he nice. can't be, he can't be a part of the advocacy conference mm-hmm. because he's a government employee. That's kind of a conflict of interest. You can't. You can't advocate if sure. you're working for the government. That's, that's your job is to work, not to advocate. So, anyway, Andy, we do. So we are ending at seven, but yep, yep. I think that this all Sorry. sounds fantastic. Um, I did want to let people know that if anyone was really interested in looking at the uh, Dean Simmons, the Cayman Brothers at IRI in 2013 with Demanda Cayman, she did, they did a cover of "Just Give Me a Reason" by Pink, um, and so there is now a link in the chat for that just to make sure you all had access to it. Um, and just so you know, there are multiple other uh, opportunities to look at different videos in that, that link. So have a good they can time. guess, they can guess who some of the characters are maybe. They maybe, but they're not characters. They're real people, Andy. So, yes. all right. So we are going to wrap this up. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone on Thursday. Uh, please don't forget uh, that we are going to, um, allow every like you can sign up at signupgenius.com slash go slash fin live um in order to sign up to do either a round table discussion a fin talk where it's like a highly engaging one speaker one topic or even quick tips from teams um but we're looking forward to seeing what our community has to bring to the table and if we get an overwhelming response uh, which, you know, today was pretty good for our first time with really limited uh, planning and access. So um, I think, you know, next time we do this, we'll have even more people. Uh, we'll be back next Thursday from 4 to 7 and then on Friday again from 4 to 7 as well uh, with a few different topics. And we'll start getting the, the information about what we'll be going over and reviewing uh, out on Monday. So thanks, everybody, for your time. I really appreciate it and have a good rest of your night.